So, good morning and uh, welcome from my side. So, so, we basically just continue where we left off yesterday. So, we're a bit, I'm a little bit behind schedule, but uh, it's not so critical. Um, so, this first hour or maybe until the coffee break. We'll look at uh, influ influence diagrams, which is basically nothing else but, or can be interpreted as nothing else but a Bayesian network where we add what we call decision nodes. So this is, we use here the square to, inter to, to show that. And we also add uh, utility nodes. So utility in the example that we are looking at today, we, we, or that Jochen gave yesterday, the utilities were just costs. No? Uh, now there is a whole thing about utility theory and I don't want to go into this now. Um, so for the moment we can just consider these utilities to be some <coughs> expression of, of consequences. No? And in Jochen's example we use monetary consequences. I guess if there is some time, maybe also tomorrow, we can also, or, or later today, we can also discuss about what do we do, or how do we consider non-monetary consequences. So obviously, if we deal with structures, often we have the case that consequences are safety related, so potentially loss of human lives. And there is some, it's at least a bit controversial to assign monetary values to, to those type of consequences. Um, but as I said, for now we just accept that we just accept that we, that we can express our consequences by some measure. We can think of it as, as money or you can think of it as utility. All right, now <coughs> I'm going to we come back to this example of Jochen a bit, a bit later. Now to start with, I show this example that is also in the lecture notes that you have. So I'm going to rush through this a bit with the idea that if you want to try to, I mean, study this yourself, the example is completely documented in the, in the lecture notes, so you can actually go afterwards and study it by yourself. So, but I, do, but I, I have that this problem, and I introduce first the problem without without any monitoring, just to motivate it, and then I'll show you how that develops, how that goes into monitoring, and how that is, is how the, the influence diagram is used to represent that. Simple, very simple problem. I have to choose a foundation. Uh, the, you, know, you want to build a house, this is on a slope, and there is some uncertainty as to if the slope is actually stable or potentially moving. Now, if you want to, ha if you have a, if you have a moving slope, you want to have a deep foundation. Whereas, so with piles. Whereas, if you have a stable slope, a shallow foundation, cheaper might be sufficient. Typical geotechnical problem, and in geotechnics, actually, there's a lot of uncertainty and. If we speak of, of, of inspection, monitoring, you know, doing measurements, geotechnics is really a field where this is done all the time. So, 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 so but, but here we first, at first we don't have a measurement, we just have this, this case uh, where we have to make a decision between deep foundation and shallow foundation. And in this decision tree, there's, uh, we have these as two possible, these are shown as two branches, and following those decisions, we have a system state. So now, this is not a temporal order necessarily because the slope is there before we make a decision. But it's the order in which we kind of observe what will happen. So that's why we, we put it in this way. Um, so here's the decision, and then we have a realization of the system. And the consequences, the utilities here, are associated with the combination of what we decide and how the system is behaving. 
So this is very basic. This is a very basic example for basic decision analysis. What uh, Sebastian presented yesterday. I'm just going to use that example later, so, so I'm showing it. Okay. So you see here, I have not put any numbers, but I can also put numbers here, so that we can calculate something. Yes. So we just assume, and these costs you can multiply with uh, 100,000 euros, then you have uh, say reasonable numbers for costs. So, now if you want to make a decision, what do we do? We, uh, if Sebastian showed, no, you just calculate expected costs or consequences, expected utility, um, and you find the decision that gives according to the decision theory, the higher expected utility, or in this case, the lower expected cost. Since utility would be minus cost. Um, that's, you know, that's just an instance, and this I show here, of the generic decision tree. Yeah. So this is really what Sebastian showed yesterday. All right. Good. Um, the answer here, if you look in the lecture notes, you will see that in this case it's better to do a deep foundation because you, what, what you have to do is you have to multiply here. Or, uh, I'm thinking if I should let, no, I will just, I'll let you do something later. So this is, so, so what you do is you multiply the probability of a moving slope with the consequences associated here or the consequences, oh, okay, let's, one, one thing, okay, one by one. So if, if we want to figure out what is the ex expected consequences associated with the shallow foundation, we take the costs here, those are the two minus two, multiplied with the probability of this branch, which is 0 0.7, so minus 1.4, plus the consequences here, which are minus 10, minus 12 actually, minus 12 multiplied with 0 0.3, so 0 0.36, and you sum them together. So minus, no, 3 point, minus 3.6, so minus 3.6, so the, to, together we get around minus 5. And then you do, and, and when you do the same here, you see that the consequences actually do not depend on what happens, because once we choose the deep foundation, no matter what happens, this, the house is okay. So in that case, it's, the cost is simply minus four. So minus five, expected cost, minus, minus four, and the, the better choice here is to choose this lower expected cost. Good. And now, let's continue and make an influence diagram of this problem. I mean, obviously, it's a very simple problem, so completely, I would use this decision tree here. It's completely fine. But now, how does the corresponding influence diagram look like in this example? I'll give you the answer. The inverse diagram looks like this, very simple. And it's, we have a, a node for the decision. In this case, that's the foundation type. We have a node for the random variables. In this case, only one. That's the, the slope. So is it stable or moving? And we have a utility node, and we use these diamond-shaped nodes to, to show utilities, those are the costs. The interesting thing in, the, in this is again are the, are the links. How are things linked to each other? Um, now, what we see here is both the foundation and the slope affect the consequences. Yes. Maybe more interesting is that there is no arrow here. This means that this particular decision has no effect on our random variable, on our state of, we call it state of nature also. 
so the foundation does not change the slope hmm, in this example. In a more general case, however, there, there could be a link from a decision to a random variable. Hmm? So if the, for example, the action would be to, to stabilize the slope, then there would be a, a link from the action to the slope. Um, So the links are, in the same way as the Bayesian networks, the links are an important thing that give the kind of how things are dependent. Now I already explained yesterday that the influence diagram is really important that you model it in a causal manner. In principle, again, there are examples where you can do models that are not causal and are still okay, as I showed yesterday for the Bayesian network. But it's very easy to make a mistake. And uh, at least if you don't have a lot of experience, it's not recommendable. So always try to follow the causal mm, flow. Hmm? So first thing. Second, we can have, of all these type of nodes, so these, are, these are the basic nodes, there's, uh, there's nothing else than that. But of all these nodes, we can have one or multiple. Hmm? So we can have multiple decisions, we can have multiple utility nodes, and of course we can have multiple random variables. So, in print, let me show you here. No? So, here is the Bayesian network. We have multiple random variables, and we have, in this case, just one decision, but we'll, uh, of course, have late, later more decisions, no? because we have also decisions on, on the number of tests, for example. And we have, we can easily have multiple utilities, costs. No? So, we have a cost of a failure, but we also have a cost of a design. We have uh, potentially a cost of, of doing tests, so we, we can add different utilities nodes. Now we need to, so we, we, we know how to so basically the random variable parts we know already because this is just the rules from the Bayesian network that we that are still valid. Yeah? I should maybe say that actually the influence diagram was was, was developed in, in, in sort of parallel to the Bayesian network. And while the Bayesian network was developed by people that come more from the artificial intelligence community, the influence diagram was actually developed more by people that come from a management uh, theory background. Yeah. So, but it, but it's, these things went kind of in parallel, and, and, and the way we use it today, it's consistent. Yeah. So the Bayesian network can be directly extended to the influence diagram. So, we, but we still need to understand the semantics, so the rules, for how to use these decision nodes here and the utility nodes. What is the meaning of a link that goes from a decision node to a random variable, like we have it here, or from a decision node to a utility, or from a random variable to a utility, and so on. Utility, I should mention that utility nodes cannot have children, okay? So utility nodes are always we call them terminal nodes. So there is no link going out of a utility node. Hmm? That, that wouldn't make, that, there's no meaning to that. Um, links going into the utility nodes are quite easy to interpret. So um, the utility node, as we will see later, is basically a table, or if it's discrete, it's a table. It can also be continuous. But it's basically a function that assigns a utility or a cost in function of each of those parents. So in this case, we have two parents, so on the, each, each one has two states, so there are four possible combinations of parents, and for each of those, we have an associated consequence. So these are exactly those four combinations here that you see here. This was a minus 2, minus 12, minus 4, minus 4. The table that is describing this node contains exactly those four values. Okay. Then, the links that come from a decision node to a random variable, they can be interpreted in the same way as we already know when we have a link from a random variable to a random variable. That means that this the random variable here is defined conditional on the decision. Yes? So in this case here, 
the capacity is defined conditional on R and conditional on W. In this special case here, it's just a function. It's just a rare deterministic function. But more generally, it can be also probabilistic. Finally, this is not here and not here, but there can also be links to a decision node. This is an important part that we will, that we will um, use, an important feature. What is the meaning, what is the meaning of, a, of a link to a decision node? Somebody knows that? Yes. yes. I mean, there's, there can be both things. Yes. So, they, so, so they, you, you said two things. One is that the outcome is known. So that's the first thing. So if if I have a link from from a random variable to a decision node, <coughs> it means that when I make this decision, let's assume it's not the case, but let's assume I have a link here from R to W. That would imply that when I make the decision on W, I have full knowledge of R. That would of course be great because that would mean that I know exactly the, 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 the yield strength of the steel and I can, I can optimize my W for the given value of R. Now that's not the case in this, in this example, but if I, would, if I were to make this, this, this link, then that would mean that. Second case, and this is also something we will maybe discuss more tomorrow when we look at the sequential decision making, is that I can also, if, if I have a link that goes from a decision to a, to a decision node, so I can have between two decisions, I can have links. The meaning is that, as you say, there's a, there's a temporal order to the decisions. Um, it's, in, it's important to realize that in the decision, in the inference diagram, we have to specify a temporal order of decisions. Just to make an example, let us assume that I will also make a decision on, on the, on, on, what can I make a decision on? Uh, okay, on the tests that will come later, but if you have a second decision here on the, on the, on the number of tests, that will be a, a node here somewhere that points somewhere here. Inherently, to the inference diagram, um, in, this, in that case, it's not clear, I think, which decision is taken first. Or is it? I guess, maybe, okay. Let, let's assume, let's have a different example. Let's assume I can make a decision on Q. For some reason, I can choose, uh, it's a bridge, so I can choose whether I, ex whether I, let, whether I make restrictions on traffic or not. Hmm. That would be a decision. Now, it's not clear that that would be a link from, from, a, from a decision node here to Q. Now, it's not clear which of those decisions is taken first. And in this particular example, also it wouldn't matter. But, but, but uh, the algorithms that are used to compute and need to know which of those two decisions is made first. So we have to give an ordering of decisions. And in order to, to tell the, the computer, or also ourselves sometimes, which of the decisions is taken first, I would make a link from the decision that is taken first, maybe this one, to this here. If you use the Genie software, I will show an example later. If you use this software and you don't add this link, the software will add a link by itself just assuming and, and some ordering. Because without the ordering, it cannot make the computations. Hmm? Which already points to, for example, to one example of type, one type of decision problems that cannot be solved with the inference diagram directly, and that is to find the optimal ordering of decisions. Right? So let's, just, let's assume you can inspect the multiple components in a, in a, in a bridge. Yeah? and say, okay, I'm going to inspect uh, these components, but should I inspect first this one or first this one? 
that's actually a type of decision that cannot, or it can, it can eventually be, up, be implemented in an influence diagram, but it's actually quite complicated because you can't just put the decisions individually and then let the algorithm find the optimal ordering because it will not do that. It requires you to, to say, okay, I make first the decision on inspecting the component number one, and then I make a decision on inspecting component number two. You can't let it decide what is better. We, we come back to that also later. For the moment, we remember Bayesian network semantics or rules stay the same. Utility nodes have no outgoing links, and the ingoing links mean that the, the cost here is a function of those ingoing variables. Decision nodes can have children. If they are random variables, it means that these are defined conditional on the decision we take. If it's a utility, it's just function, the cost is a function of that decision. And you can have ingoing links, which means that the random, vari the random variables that, that point to this node are known when I make the decision, or other decisions are done previously, temporal ordering. Okay. Please, yes. Uh, when you say decision rule, you mean what exactly? So we have a condition state that specifies what kind of action we should be taking. Okay, so for example, so what, okay, so the, what you call decision rule is, is what I also sometimes call decision rule, but now I, I call it a policy. So, so what you're saying is that, okay, whenever I observe A, I'm doing B, for example. No? So whenever I'm observing that my structure has uh, some cracks, I'm going to repair. That would be a decision rule. We don't implement that here. Because the, in principle, the influence diagram just tries to search among all possible policies or decision rules. So it tries to figure out, you just give options and maybe it becomes clear when I show the implementation in the, in the code. But basically, you just say, tell it, okay, you, you, you define the full problem and then you let it find the optimal policies or decision rules. Uh, what you describe is already is kind of a, is a, is a, is something that helps us to solve the problem. No? And I mean, the, what I show here again is is a, is, a, is a, something that helps us to model the problem. No? The the solution to the problem, the inverse diagram is does not really have, or it's, it's not a, it's not attached to a specific way of solving the problem. We still have to, 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 to solve the problem, and that can be computationally very costly. I mean, the genie software solves the problem, but it does not have a particularly efficient algorithm to solve the problem. So if you, if, if you have too many decisions, it will stop working, as we will see. We'll come back to that. Okay, so this is a kind of a consequence of, of this. Um, it's also, uh, you find this is also in the lecture notes, I think, uh, this graph here. So, these are three different types of situations, and this is like a, think of, the, this is the prior situation, if you want. Uh, this would be kind of a posterior situation. Uh, so the prior situation is, this example we, we just saw, uh, looks like this. In principle, if you want to make, make it very general, you also have a link from A to theta. No? Because A, sorry, A could, the decision could also be a, a influencing example, as I said, to stabilize the slope. Or in the, in the, yeah. so in, in other examples, like here, the W will affect the capacity. No? So the, but it's a situation where when I make the decision, I say given information, it means that I know the probabilistic description, prior probabilistic description of, of my, my state of nature, my, my system variable, but I do not have any additional information. It's, we have to deal with what we know and then we have to find the optimal decision. And that's 
the problem shown before or shown the first problem was shown by Jochen yesterday. Now, this here, because of the semantics that we introduced, implies that when I make the decision, I know exactly what is the, sta the state of nature and there is no uncertainty in my problem. Yes? Because when I make the decision, I know exactly what is the, the random variable. Because we have only one random variable in this very simple scheme here. Yes? So I know exactly what's going on and I can make a deterministic decision. No need for probably probability. And this is the situation that we have typically, which is that in a posterior case, which is that we have information, but it's not deterministic. So this would, for example, be a, t a test. So taking the slope example, this is my, my slope. Now I'm geotechnical engineers are doing exactly that. They're going and they do side tests. They do some, they take uh, some profiles. And they try to figure out whether the slope is stable or not. And, but this is not always based, or, or typically not based on directly measuring the quantity of interest, but on some indirect observation. And that indirect observation is what I have available to make my decision. Yes. So in principle, when I, or maybe we come back to this later here. So, so just to, 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 to clarify the, the meaning of, 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 this, of this arrow here. <coughs> okay. So this is all the theory that you need to know about influence diagrams. No, one thing I forgot to say, last thing. Uh, if you have multiple utility nodes, as I said, you can have easily multiple utility nodes because you have a cost of a failure, you have a cost of um, inspection, and so on. Then the assumption is that those utilities are additive. They are independent and additive. So it means that and if you have a little bit of experience with, with utility theory, then you know what, what, what I mean by that. Essentially, it means that we, we can just sum up the utilities from coming from different utility nodes to calculate the, to, the total utility. OK. So. OK, this slide is not. Oh. Slides, some of these slides are just copied from, my, from, from another lecture, so this is something you know already. And uh, I don't have to repeat, but I let the slide here anyway to remind us why we are here. Okay, information is not for free. And this information set here that, that we assume to have comes at the cost. And, and there is a decision associated, like here, with whether or not we should actually collect this information. Um, and this leads to what we want to do here, value of information, yeah. optimization of inspection, monitoring. Could also be figuring out what is the appropriate level of, of, of an engineering model. Yeah. How much engineering we should, we should, how much we should spend on, 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 doing, an, on doing an analysis. Yeah. Actually, one of the first times I came across this problem was when I think I was still, I'm not sure if I was a PhD student or master student, but I had to do some work on, on a, there was like a, I mentioned to somebody yesterday. So it's a rockfall gallery. So this is a structure that we have in the mountains. Basically it's like a concrete roof to protect from potentially falling rocks. There's a rock cliff. Can be a, some rocks can be a common stable and we don't want them to fall on the highway. So we have, there's this rock fall gallery. And there was a question whether that gallery is still okay or whether it needs to be improved or strengthened. And so I got, uh, I got this report, which was made by a structural engineer, expert in, in concrete structures. And he wrote a thick report and made a very detailed analysis of this problem. So he looked at the impact, well, this is the impact problem. 
and he did a very detailed analysis. It's not a you know, simple problem, obviously, and he there's a lot of some uncertainty associated with that. So he tried to make a very a, a very good model, and, and he wrote a very large report. He made very detailed calculations, and so on. But he had, of course, to assume a load on, on so he had to assume that the, the rock will fall. So what did he do? He didn't really have good information from the geologists, so he just assumed that there was a one cubic meter rock falling 70 meters on that roof. Yes? On that, based on that assumption, he made a very detailed analysis. And I spent on how many months he spent on that. Yes? But completely useless, if I, want, if I should say that, because there's obviously a huge uncertainty on what type of rock will actually come, how, how high it will fall. Uh, it could easily be three cubic meters, or five, or just half, or, 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 and, and it could be uh, falling from 50 meters, or 70 meters, or I don't know what. So in making the, the model more accurate, even if the uncertainty would be plus minus 100%, doesn't make any sense at all. There is no value in getting a better model because the uncertainty coming from the, the inputs on, on the load side is so large the decision will, on whether this, is, this structure is okay or not, does not get much or even any, anything any better by, by having a very detailed model on the resistance side. Uh, so that's also a kind of a value of information analysis that one should do. Yeah? And maybe save a few months of engineering time. Yes? Just to mention that. Okay, and then. Yes. So, that's just a more general thing. Now, what I want you to do you now is on a piece of paper, go and take this example here. It's a very general case. And you can think of this as the slope cape, slope problem. Here is a set, it's a test. The test, uh, for example, the drilling some boreholes. Um, and can you extend this so that we add, uh, can answer the question whether it makes sense to do a test or what type of test? So how, how, with what do I have to extend this? influence diagram, how do I have to extend it so that I can answer this question. Should I do a test? And maybe what type of test should I do? Can we extend this from a posterior to a pre-posterior problem? Okay, so I guess that by now uh, we have either a solution or we have nothing, but... Um, okay, so how, so how do we extend this inference diagram to consider the, the, the pre-posterior case, so the optimization of the test itself? Some suggestion? So there should be a choice, choice node or decision node, yes, uh, before here, so somewhere here you have a square node that points to set, yes. That's it. And the utility node, that is a child to this decision node. Otherwise, well, we could have it without the utility node, that would imply that, the, that this is for free, and in that case, as we learned also yesterday, is that you know, it's never bad to have information. So in that case, it will always tell us, okay, get the information. So, but yes, there is a cost associated, and that would then be represented, oops, like this. No? So so in the, in the classical decision analysis, at least the way it's used in, in civil engineering, is that we have E standing for something that is an experiment, so it's a, it's, a, it's a decision on whether to collect information, and A is this kind of action note, which is decision on, on doing something. But of course, more generally, it can be, you know, you can just write here test or whatever you want. I mean, they, 
there's no need to, to restrict to that. But the, that's why it's called E here. And then there's the utility associated with E. And there's the utility associated with, this is the same, with what we decide to do and with what we, what is the actual state of the system. Hmm? Now we have these two utility nodes, and, and exactly as, we, as I said before, they're being separate means that the, the total utility is just the sum of the two. So they say there's a cost associated with the inspection, and there's a, or the test, and the cost associated with what ultimately happens. Again, if you look at these books by, by, mentioned yesterday by Benjamin Cornell and so on, they call it UT, where T stands for terminal. So this is the where E stands the cost of the experiment. All right, so that's in theory quite straightforward. Of course, as we will see later, you know, when we look at a specific case, then it's not just theta, but we have more random variables and, and we might have multiple decisions. Also, when we look tomorrow at sequential decisions, we'll not have a decision only at one point in time, but we have decisions at maybe every point in time. Um, so it can become much more complex, but the basics are all here. And, you know, yesterday Sebastian already showed this, and this is the corresponding decision tree, and what you cannot really appreciate here is that this tree already has many, many, potentially at least, many branches. And uh, we have only one random variable here, we have only one action here, and only one experiment, E, and it's already the pre is large. But if let's assume we, we, we add additional decisions, additional random variables, this tree becomes larger and larger and larger, and becomes, you know, kind of, it's, it's difficult to see anything in that tree. Whereas here, it's very concise. The disadvantage is, of course, that here you can actually see the, the different states that can be taken. You can see here the consequences that are, you can directly see what is the consequence from a certain combination of decisions and outcomes, um, which is here is hidden inside of the nodes. So, so that's the kind of advantage of having this representation. But yes, very fast it becomes difficult to see. But there's a second. There's, a, there's, a, there's an additional advantage of this representation. So this has information here that is not directly visible in this tree. What, what else do I see from here that I cannot see from directly, at least, from the corresponding tree? Well, if I, have, if I want to give evidence, yes, then this, this so, so, so here, so, so, so here we, be, we still assume that we give no evidence, yeah? so I, I will come back to that later. Um, here we still give no evidence, of course we could then also add evidence, say okay, now we observe this. For the moment we, we are not putting evidence here, we're just saying that when I make that, when I get to make that decision, I'm going to have that evidence, but I don't yet have it, yeah? so that's the pre-posterior. In principle, I could add evidence here, but that it's, it's also, if, if I have evidence here, it actually means that, for example, let's, have, let's say I have evidence now on set, it just means that I can just ignore all the, I can just look at the branch that corresponds to this evidence. So that the evidence could actually also be looked at here. So that, but what, what is the advantage? What is the advantage of, of, of this graph here? The cost of the study. Sorry. Well, it's also, you know, it's also, well, it's, yes, actually it's also in the decision tree in the sense that the, the cost is all here, you know, that the, and, and, and in principle, when I make the, the what should be at the end of each branch is the, is the sum of UT and UE. So if I choose this particular branch here, it gives me the, it, it will put me here the cost associated with choosing the experiment. So in that sense, it's also there. No, but what, what I wanted to say is that here, we can also see the causal, or at least the, the kind of dependence among different variables. For example, what we see here is that 
A does not affect theta. No? Um, which is something, or in particular this becomes more evident here when we have a larger number of, of random variables. If you would make a decision tree here, it would just be with every additional node, it would just be more branches. But we will not see how those random variables and decisions are related in a causal manner. You go, you go with this to, to let's say, people who, engineers who work on SHM, who have not no or limited background in, on decision analysis and, and, and optimization, you can communicate this to them and say, okay, you know, this is, these are my random variables. When I, you know, I, can, I have to I have an action here, and then we can add here the notes on, on the on the tests. So similar to here, or let's say here, so this is the problem, and the test will tell me something about theta, and that will influence my decision here. I mean, it's still not so easy to understand, but at least here you can kind of see what happens, hmm? how things are related to each other. Here you don't see that, yes? well, you can see it if you look at the numbers that are written here, but that will be very difficult. So the advantage is that this gives me, a, this, this shows me the structure of the problem, I have an overview of the problem. The, on, the, uh, the only advantage of this representation is that it, it gives me the complete information. But that's also the disadvantage because if that information is more than what fits on one page, it will be too large. So, Go back to this example, and I'm showing you now the implementation for this particular example. So the foundation concept, the same as before, prior problem as before. Now, does it make sense to perform a test for deciding on the foundation type? So what do I need as additional information? Um, as, as opposed to what I already have here. Well, if we compare this is the problem we have already looked at. Now, the problem that we're trying to solve is this one. So we need basically this we need to define this part of the problem. E, well, E is simple. Decision E is, has no parent, is just do the test or not. No? Then we need this node here. That will be well, the cost of doing the test or not doing it. Cost of not doing it is zero. Cost of doing it is something that we need to know. And finally, we need this node, and we need to know, we need this node set. Set is the what is that? That is the outcome of the test. <coughs> now, this is the conditional on E and on theta. Oh. If E, if the decision is to not inspect or not do a test, the outcome is simply no outcome or no, nothing, nothing observed. Right? Irrespective of what, what is uh, theta. If the division here is yes, we do test, then set will be the outcome of the, the experiment, the test, conditional on what is the state of nature, the state of my slope. And how does that look? This is the information. In this example here, this is the information. So I'm saying, okay, if I do a test, then I can have three possible outcomes. You can see that I can observe that there are no movements. I can observe that there are slight movements or there are strong movements. These are the conditional probability of observing these things, given that this is my state. So if I have a stable slope, 
it, probability is 0 0.9 that I do not observe anything. But there is still a 0 point, there's 1 percent probability of observing strong movement. So there's some kind of measurement error, if you want. If I have a moving slope, I still have a probability that 30 percent that I observe nothing. Maybe because in this particular period of the, of the measurement there's no movement, but that doesn't mean that there's no movement in general. So the observation is not perfect. If, you, if it was perfect, I would have probability one here and probability one here, and probability zeros everywhere else. That would be a perfect observation. But the reality is not perfect. So I have an imperfect observation, and I need this information here to describe the quality of my information, of my test. Yes. And if you, and they come back to that later when I speak about generally how to model the, the quality of, of, of information. Yeah? The, this is nothing else but a likelihood function, yes? So if you know about Bayesian analysis, or if you just know about general statistics, maximum likelihood estimation, yes? This is a likelihood function, where we give a probability of a certain outcome, test result, given a certain state of of the parameters that we want to know about. Given theta, what I've said. Okay, so this is the information we need. And with this, we can either go and do, this is what Sebastian showed yesterday, basically, solve the decision tree. In this case, the decision tree looks like this. If you're in the lecture notes, is the, is the, is the solution, so you can find it there if you are interested. Or you can use the influence diagram to solve it. And um, I'm doing the second, of course. So we are using the influence diagram. And I'm showing you how, for such a simple example, how easy that is. Whereas you know, solving this is a kind of annoying and needs some work and also needs some, you know, yeah. it's not super difficult, but but with the inverse diagram, it's quite, it becomes very simple. So, again, I'm using this software here. And I have here the prior problem. The prior problem is foundation, yes, or what type of foundation? Slope, and then the utility. And this is defined exactly as I said. So, if the foundation decision has just two, two options, shallow and deep, and then nothing else specified, no probability, of course, because that's just a decision. The slope has just these two probabilities, 0 0.7 of stable, 0 0.3 moving, and the utility has these four values, okay, now it's, Okay, it was not, before it was minus 2, now it's minus 200, but whatever. So it's minus 200 for shallow foundation, minus 400 for a deep foundation. If the slope is stable, and if the slope is moving, the deep foundation is minus, still minus 400, but the shallow foundation will be minus uh, 1200 because first I pay 200 to build it, and then I have 1,000 in damages. Yes. So total is minus 1,200. And that's it. And with this, we can just go and run it. So, and then we check what it tells us. It tells us the value for the decision node. The value for the decision node is the expected utility. Yeah. So it tells us that if I choose shallow foundation, the expected utility is minus 5, or minus 500. Deep is minus 400. Yeah. So the optimal choice is to choose the deep foundation. Yeah. That's... Yes. Clear? That's, of course, also rather trivial. But that's basically what we have. Now, um, 
Okay, let me maybe, I have already the solution, but maybe I will show, I will now add it here manually so that you can see the process. So now I'm going to add the, the, the possibility of the test. So, or how is it called? The test. Test. Outcome. This is the test outcome. And the test outcome had, oops, what happened now? Ah, oh, this was not the, I did something stupid. I added, not a, this was not, sorry. This was not a random variable, this was an object. Submodel. So this is what I said yesterday, you can add sub, basically an object here, which is, which is a, a Bayesian network in itself, but this is not what I wanted. So, here. Yeah. Test outcome. And so we do first, let's first assume that we actually do the test. No cost, we just do the, we just do the test. Okay, the test outcome has three, pos had three possible states. No, there was like no movement, slight movement, and the third one was uh, strong movements. Yes, this was what, what uh, we could observe. Okay. Now it looks like this because there's no parent to it. But when I add here with this thing, I add it, this as a parent. Then I, have, I can specify the outcome. I can specify here the outcome conditional on the state. So I have to recall the numbers, so oops, no. where were we here? Were we? 0 0.9, 0 0.09, 0 0.01, 0 0.9, 0 0.01. And if it's moving, it was 0 0.2, I think. Five, yes, and the three. No, 0 0.3, 0 0.5, 0 0.2, okay. 0 0.3, 0 0.5, 0 0.2. Okay, so we see already that this is, yeah, okay. All right, so that's how it is, and now, I mean, if I do it like this, there's no effect on the decision. Okay, let's run it quickly. And if you do it like this, the decision is still the same because I have no idea. I mean, I will, I'm, not, I'm assuming that I don't know the outcome when I do the foundation design. So there's no benefit of having this test outcome. I, if I want, I can check what is the outcome, but there's no meaning. Now, okay, maybe I should mention this. Yeah, so, because we spoke of evidence before. So, if I say, for example, okay, now I'm actually in the posterior case, like we had yesterday, and I have already observed something. I have done the test, and I have an outcome. So then I can give evidence here, set evidence. For example, we have observed that there is a strong movement. I'm fixing this. I'm updating, and now I can check again the expected utility. So you see that the optimal decision is obviously still the deep foundation. The cost of this is the same, but the expected utility associated with the shallow foundation has now gone, the cost has gone up a lot. Because if we have observed a strong movement, that indicates that it's rather likely that there is a problem and we should not build a shallow foundation. So once I observe evidence, the problem, I mean, I just give it, I just give it as evidence in the Bayesian network and, and it runs the, the analysis, conditional on that evidence. Yeah. That's straightforward. But the pre posterior case is where we have not yet actually observed the evidence. We have still, we're still in the situation where we we are thinking of whether we should gather the, the evidence. So, 
I'm going to not do this, clear evidence. Instead, I'm going to add an arrow from test outcome to foundation. Yes. Now, here I don't need to specify, you know, the foundation, I don't need to, I don't need to specify anything here in addition. Mm -hmm. It's still just the two options that I have. The, the, and, and this arrow, for this reason, is also da is kind of dashed arrow. Huh? So it, it, is a, it is an arrow that represents information that flows. But now, when I do the optimization, well, what does it do? Now it tells me that, okay, test outcome is a matrix, yes. So, now the, the, the decision, the optimal decision, is given in function of the test outcome. Huh? So if I, and it tells me that if the test outcome, it's a bit small, but if the test outcome is no movement, I should build the shallow foundation. With associated utility minus expected utility minus 325. If the test outcome is a slight or strong movement, I should build the deep foundation. Yeah? Often that's kind of what we would expect, I guess. But this depends on the numbers we put there. Yeah? But that's now directly the result of a posterior analysis, but for all possible post outcomes that we could have. Yes? And now we're going to add the pre-posterior case. So I want to actually figure out whether the test makes sense. So I'm, I'm putting here a note that says test, question mark. Oops. And this has two, two possible choices or, or, or alternatives. I can either test, I say yes, or I don't test, no. no? This is associated with the, utility, with, the, with the cost, so I put here this utility or value node, so this is the cost of the test, UE we called it. And I'm going to make a link here, and I have here to give the cost of the test. So I don't remember what that was. And I think it doesn't say here, it doesn't say here. Doesn't say anywhere, but I think maybe here, yes, 0 0.2. Okay, so if I do a test, it costs me 0 0.2, and this is minus. Yeah. No test is for free, so no test. That's what you did. And then I have a link from test to test outcome. Okay, now what am I missing? What, I, or what have I not defined yet? Yes, exactly. Yeah. Actually, this, you see that <laughs> the software is smart. Uh, it shows this arrow as gray, which means that this arrow, as of yet, has no, has no effect because I have not actually specified what happens, what is the effect of this decision on, on this. So I have to change this table here, which is easy to do. So what it does is, I mean, when I add the link, it just copies the table from before, isn't it? Yes, so it just, okay. So well, first of all, the ordering is not convenient, so let's change the ordering, so. So what it did was, it, it said, okay, if I, if I do a test or not, it doesn't change the probabilities. And of course, it does change the probabilities. So if I do a test, I have exactly what I had before, that's okay. If I don't do a test, then what should I have as outcome? Uniform, well, it sounds at first reasonable, but I'm afraid no. <laughs> Actually, when you have no, when you don't do a test, what do you observe? You observe nothing. Hmm? So we have to actually add a test, a state that says no observation. And in case that I don't do a test, yes, yes. Oops. Uh, this is what I'm going to observe with probability one. Yeah. So that's how I. It's kind of a trick. Well, trick. This is how I include that. Yes. So if I 
what the software does, or the, the algorithm that is behind is doing, is that it's, so in this case here, it's doing a kind of, if you want, implicitly, it's doing a Bayesian updating. Huh? Here, it's still doing a Bayesian updating, but the Bayesian updating with this probabilities will just result in the prior distribution. So it will not change anything. Because no matter what is the state, I always observe the same thing. Okay, so that's how we do it. And now I think we can run. Oops, there's a problem. Oh. Technical problem. Um, now we can run the whole thing. Okay, we see here. Now the, the, the choice of the foundation it still is a matrix. Now it's even a bigger matrix. See here, I'm going to go back to that. What we, are not, what we actually want to know is the test, whether we should do a test or not. Does it make sense? And the answer is, yes, it makes sense. We have a lower expected cost in, if we do the test than if we don't do the test. Mm -hmm. This is the full pre-posterior analysis. The value of information now is a bit hidden because we have here the, the cost of the, the test. So basically the, di the difference between these two things is what, is what I call the net value of information. Mm -hmm. So that's the value of information already taking into account that we have to pay for the information as well. Mm -hmm. So this is the, the cost. If, if I want to know the, the value of information without that, then I would have to put this to zero. Uh, by the way, it tells us that we should do the test, and that the expected utility is, is significantly lower if I do the test. Hmm? And this is based on the assumption that when we, do the, when we choose the foundation, we always pick, of course, the optimal, the optimal choice. Hmm? And that means that the optimal choice would be, now I'm opening this table here again, value. Uh, so the, this decision now depends on the, not only on the uh, test outcome, but it depends also on the previous decision. Uh, you see, some of those combinations of test outcomes and, and uh, test decision are impossible. So if I don't do a test, I cannot observe a slight movement. So this is impossible. When I don't do a test, I can just have no observation, and in that case, the utilities are exactly what we know, minus five and minus four. Oh, I made a mistake. Slight mistake. But the utility here should have been defined as, well, that's minus zero point, minus 20. Okay, yes, still. Okay. Um, so, yes, yeah, so they still the same. So the prior is not, the prior decision in a way is still the same. When we do the posterior, it tells us that, okay, if I, if I find in the test that there is no movement, then I should choose the shallow foundation because that gives me a lower utility. Sorry, lower cost, higher utility. And otherwise, I'm still choosing the deep foundation. And now that has become more expensive because I have to, I added the, the, the cost of 20 for the, for the test itself. So in case I find uh, some movements, I actually end up paying more because I have to pay also the test. So in a way, after the fact, so given that information, I have not doubt that information, I'm actually ending up paying more. But initially, because there's a quite a high probability that I will actually observe no movement, it makes sense to do the test. But in retrospect, you might end up paying more and still doing the deep foundation. Yeah? This is something we keep in mind. Yeah? So for two out of the three outcomes, it turns out that I'm ending up paying more, only in the case of no movement observed, I get to pay less. But that justifies the test. Okay. 
Anyway, so you can solve this. This is really the most basic type of problem that we could have for pre-posterior analysis. You can solve it also with the decision tree. And in the lecture notes, you find both the, the, the this is what they call the normal form of the analysis and the extensive form of the analysis. But, um, but what I want to show here is that with the influence diagram, it's straightforward to model, and, and, and this, for these simple problems, this, these softwares can, can do the analysis. What I will discuss then tomorrow is that this software, however, is not going to be very efficient once we end up having many decisions to make. Let's assume we, we have a problem of inspection or, or monitor, inspection or monitoring, whatever, predictive, predictive maintenance, these type of problems where we have to make decisions at every time interval. For example, every year we have to make a decision whether we should inspect or not, or every year we have to make a decision on whether we should do some maintenance or not. You end up having, for example, 50 decisions. And what happens will then be that it, the, the, the software will try to do exactly what it does here, namely that it will construct the, the last decision to be made will be, will be conditional on the 49 previous decisions. And that table again comes 2 to the power of 50. So that table would become impossibly large and therefore the software doesn't, will just stop, just stop producing a result. Yeah? So we need, if you have many decisions, we need more efficient algorithms and for example, I think at least in Genie it's not implemented. Yeah? We need, and we can actually only solve those problems well, actually, we can solve them also in the general case, but only approximately. So we can either solve them only for special cases or only approximately. But, uh, but for simple problems, you can use this software or, or other type of softwares, and you see that it works very intuitively and simple. And for more difficult problems, you can still use the influence diagram to represent your problem. You just need to figure out a more effective way of solving the problem. Okay. Are there questions up to this point? So yesterday you had mentioned that the uh, influence diagram can be used as a modeling tool as well as a computational tool. Uh, so what's the distinction between the two? Yes. Yes. No, actually, what I, actually the influence diagram can be used as a modeling tool. It's not really a, a computational tool. Yes. So underneath it, I mean the. But, but, but basically what, what um, at least what the genie here is doing is more or less doing exactly the same computations that you would do if you solve the decision tree by hand. Yes? So since this is a very small decision tree, of course the computer has no problem to, to, to just very quickly calculate all these branches. But uh, it does not actually, it does not actually have, a, at least not that I'm aware of, unless they changed it, a very uh, efficient ways of, of, of solving it. So the infos diagram does not provide me with an efficient way of, of solving the problem. No? This is different for the, Be in the Bayesian network. The fact that we have these conditional independencies gives rise to all these different algorithms. And actually, if you look in the software here, it says algorithms. No? Those are all different algorithms for solving the Bayesian network problem, not the influence diagram problem. No? So these are different algorithms, some of them um, likelihood sampling I mentioned yesterday. These are uh, kind of the exact that I also showed yesterday. Um, those are algorithms that solve the Bayesian network problem. To solve the influence diagram, it basically just uh, just solve all the branches of the decision. He kind of creates the decision tree and checks all the branches. Um, that's not efficient. Eh? The only kind of, or some of the only, uh, special, let's say, algorithms for solving influence diagrams in a way is, is basically what we call the Markovian decision processes or partially observable Markovian decision processes. And I will mention that yet tomorrow. So we'll speak more tomorrow a bit about how we can solve, potentially solve larger problems. 
So this is really just, for me, it's just a tool for modeling, for understanding the problem, for, for, for putting a paper, to understand what is the information I need to specify, but not to solve. Other questions or comments? Yes, please. Yes. But I don't understand that. Yeah, yeah, I understand. No, no, it's clear. It's a very practical question, but uh, which is, <laughs> I mean, this is based on the, on the let's say, the, what Sebastian also presented yesterday, you know, the classical decision analysis. And, and, and it's based on the assumption that you choose your decision according to the expected utility criterion. So the, whatever decision gives you the, 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 the highest expected utility is the one you pick. Um, in practice, according we know that you know, in engineering projects, so we, we have, if you have two options and one gives me a cost of total, or a total cost of uh, say 400,000 and the other one 410,000, know, it, it's, it's almost the same. Yeah. Now, strictly, if I have nothing, if, if all my criteria that I have for decision are included in my analysis, I should still pick the one that just gives me the, the, the highest utility, you know, if, even if the difference is very minor. In practice, we almost never include all the criterion in our formal analysis. No? So, for example, here we might, this is just, maybe here we just include cost, but then maybe there is also the fact that the, deeper foundation takes more time, or, it, or actually doing a test takes more time, and maybe that's not included in here. Then we would say, okay. But if you are smart, we would also include the, 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 the time as an additional cost here, so then maybe it's already count factored in. But then we say, for some reason, uh, maybe the, the owner here of the house is environmentally conscious, and he doesn't want to have a big, uh, or, I don't know. There, there can be additional reasons, no, that, that are or things that are not included as explicit what you call attributes uh, in, the, in the utility analysis. So we don't include them and say, okay, because the aesthetic, aesthetics, for example, no, maybe the one option is nicer than the other and it's not included in this analysis. And if they turn out to be almost the same cost, we would say that, okay, we just pick the one that is more beautiful. So it's not something related to the, of course, influence diagram, but more to the general decision analysis, which is at the end, it's just a tool for, for, for informing decisions. No, we are not bound to strictly relate to that. And, if we, and, and, and in all the practical problems that I have seen, it's that, okay, this gives me a first, we try to include the main criteria here, it gives me a result, and if we turn out to be almost the same, we typically factor in other criteria that might also play a role, um, and then make a decision based on that. We are not bound to, to do that decision. However, what we have to keep in mind is that when we do this kind of analysis and we have multiple decisions, what we saw is that okay, the, the decision here is based on, I mean, factors in the decision that we do here. It basically automatically assumes that here we will do the optimal decision according to decision analysis. So, but, yeah, but, but uh, for the, the, the first decision, we can just afterwards look at the result and then pick, I mean, we are not bound by this, no? it's just a tool. Yes? Yeah, um, for this decision tree, the probability of each variable being a test outcome when there is no movement, slight movement, or very high movement, how do you actually get to know the certainty of the probability you are attaching to those variables before doing the tests? Like, do you need to pass those values to account? Yes. Well, actually, you see, this is, I mean, this is of course, a, a good question because it's challenging, or sometimes can be challenging, to, to get those probabilities. Um, it's not so much related to whether it's before or after the test, because even after the test, you still don't know these probabilities. No? After the test, so you do the test, the test tells you there is a slight movement. Well, you still don't know 
I mean, it doesn't tell you anything about the quality. You know? So this is something that you have to, to, to come up with based on information other than what you have on the specific site. You know? um, and we'll discuss, I mean, it's, it's the question, how do I, how do I model the, the quality of my information? It's actually what I'm going to speak about afterwards. Um, but, to, but just to quickly give some first answer is that, I mean, you, you, for example, here we speak of uh, geotechnical problems. One good way there is actually to, to try to ask, speak with experts. They have a lot of experience on the thing, and they say, okay, I mean, for example, here, when we look at this table that we need here, let's say, okay, you know, what is, okay, if the slope is stable, then we could say, okay, the slope is stable, it actually doesn't move. No? So, there is a probability that we have a slight or strong movement observed that is actually a measurement error because the slope is actually not moving. So if you move, if you, if you see something moving, then it means there is a measurement error, and that's something that we could uh, we could try to understand from from maybe other type, other measurements or, or again the expert maybe might know that you know this is not a completely exact and this, these devices might show some noise and this noise is like this. The other thing here is, okay, if the slope is actually moving, what is the probability that we might not observe it, uh, or might observe only a slight movement? That's more related to the, to the, to the actual, not, it's not really a measurement error maybe, but it's more like maybe it's moving but not all the time. You know? So maybe it's move, maybe there's an estimate that even if it's moving, 30% of the time it will not be moving at all. Hmm? Or 50% or of the time it might move but just a little bit. And, and so, they might be related more to the geology. Again, you have to ask the expert, the geotechnical expert, what do you think that could be? And th th these numbers, I mean, whether it's 0 0.5 or 0 0.6, probably nobody can tell you. It's not the rocket science here. In other cases, we might have data that we can use. Uh, I'll, I'll show you later. So there might be other ways of, of, of figuring this out. But in this example here, where it's geotechnical, is a lot related to expert knowledge. But it's better to do that, I mean, in principle, for the pre posterior analysis, you have to do it before you do the test. But even if you are not doing a pre posterior analysis, let's say you're just doing a posterior analysis, so it has been decided to do the test, and now we want to, to, to basically do the posterior calculations, it's recommendable to do this type of analysis, to do this thinking before you, the test is done. Because People are thinking, engineers are thinking very deterministically, most engineers. Not most of us here try to think more probabilistically, but civil engineers are typically quite deterministic thinking people. And other engineers even more so. Um, and so once they observe, okay, they do a test and then there's not, no, no movement, they kind of start to tend to believe that this is really the deterministic truth. Before they observe something, it's more easy to get them to make these kind of statements and say, yeah, okay, even if maybe I might observe this, then it might not be exactly. But once they have observed, then they just tend to believe that that's the truth and that's it. Now, in this case, it's probably okay because we, we saw that the optimal decision is anyway, if you do observe nothing, you, you, you should build the shallow foundation. And if you observe a movement, you should build the deep foundation. So a deterministic decision would be actually okay here. Whenever there's a movement, make a deep foundation. But it's not always just like that. So. You also had a question? So can or you, comment? Uh, can you have a quick uh, comment on the capabilities of the software on uh, continuous random variables as well as continuous utility functions? On quantities or, or how many you mean? Or? Uh, can it Handle continuous random variables. Ah, continuous. And also continuous utility on. Good question. To be honest, I don't know. I have, I mean, I'm not using the software for my work, so I use it for teaching, these kind of things. I mean, I know that it can handle, there is a way of handling continuous um, random variables, but I'm not sure if you can actually handle influence diagrams with continuous random variables. So it might be that. So you can do continuous Bayesian networks to some degree. This you can do. 
but I'm not sure about whether you can do solve influence diagrams with continuous random variables. You have to find it out. If you find out, just let me know. Then. <laughs> Um, this is also just one software that there are multiple tools. There's all tools in, in Python, in, in MATLAB, and so on. Um, the thing is that for, for the actual problems, I mean, so I'm using these as I said, a modeling tool, we try to come up with models and so on. And then we, we, when we actually try to solve real problems, um, Okay, particularly if they come with these sequential problems and so on, in any way, they, they know that this software cannot, uh, cannot do it. Um, plus, uh, typically it's easier to just hard code, in for, 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 at least for us, it's easier to just hard code something in, in MATLAB or in Python or something like that, rather than using this existing software, because, I mean, so if you think of this, this dynamic page network that I showed yesterday, you know, this is the type of models that we then often use for, and there, we have um, we we have a, we have a regular structure and that's relatively easy to to hard code and actually you can be more efficient than these generic algorithms. So yes, so I haven't really. I know that some of my students have used things for continuous page networks here, but I'm yes, I'm not. I don't know about continuous influence diagrams. I mean, this software can do many things that I'm not showing here, so if you can just explore it yourself if this is of interest to you. All right. Um, what time is the coffee break? Hmm? No, is it already? Or is it in half an hour? Huh? A 10. Oh, okay, then I don't want to stand between you and your coffee break. So we make a break. Half an hour. I'm thinking. Okay, let's open this. Good question. Um, so the question is, okay. okay so what you suggest is to put here just a uniform distribution. Yeah, 0.3, 0.3, 0.3, 0.3, 0.3. Well, I will give not ninety eight percent. I think uh, that it will give the right result also because, I mean, the point is when you have no test, it means that whatever is the, the, the reality that you, or the, the quantity you want to, to learn about, whatever it is, you can't see it in the test result. So as long as, and I think it doesn't even have to be uniform, I think as long as the probabilities here and here are exactly the same, so, because this would be 0 0.8, 0 0.8, 0 0.2, 0 0.2. So as long as there's no difference between those two columns, if you do the Bayesian analysis, it will just tell you that the posterior is equal to the prior. Because there's no information whatsoever. So what you observe does not depend, it's independent. No? That's the whole thing, yeah, yes, 100% correct. So, because if the distribution of the test result is independent of the quantity of interest, it means they are independent, you learn nothing. So yes, you, you, so I was a bit too harsh when <laughs> I said it's not correct. The, I mean, this has the, the so, so this is a bit more, let's say, clear. Uh, otherwise you get some results that will tell you that there's a certain probability of, of, of finding uh, strong movements even if you do no test, but you're right, it give, would give the same result. Okay, other questions or comments? No. Okay, so I just want to come to an end. I mean, we go, we'll get back to the, the, the influence diagram and maybe, actually maybe we do it now because we're still awake from the coffee. So um, let's go back to the example of yesterday and now we we'll think of the preposterior problem from from uh, Jochen yesterday, and we try to to complete this graph now. So, what do we need in order to to uh, to represent uh, Jochen's problem here? What additional nodes? 
and links. Maybe I'll do them in red or blue. Okay, so first, well, so a decision on the number of experiments. So that was, uh, yes. Now this is, you see, already a bit tricky here because, okay, the way I represent it, of course we could also, um, we could also do it uh, by having n and then x bar, but I, I wanted it to be more general so that it doesn't have to be all normal. No? So, it, so the decision on the number of experiments is a bit something that is not so easy to represent here. But nevertheless, we can do it. First of all, you have to forget about these E's here. Because now in the pre-posterior analysis, we don't have the evidence yet. We potentially get it, but we don't yet have it. So there is no E here. So we have a decision on this. Let's call it N. Or how do you, you have a number for that? You have a, eh? N. N, it was, okay. So it was n, and the way we, or what, how, how could we, how could we introduce that here? I can see a way to do that, but maybe. I mean, there might be again. It's, this is a modeling task, and there's not necessarily just one solution, no? one way to do it. There could be possible, most likely, different ways of doing it. But. So I want to somehow say, okay, n is the number of tests that we do. And I have to somehow connect it to here. So how do I do that? Or how could I do that? Like this. Mm -hmm. And so on, yes. Okay, and now it means that, so how do I specify, so n is just one, zero, one, two, three, four, and so on. Yeah? These are the different options here. So, so if I would do this in, um, in Gini, I would give here zero, one, two, three, four, and so on. And by the way, you, this you can implement in Gini. Yeah? Uh, you can either, because you can, in this problem you can, well, one of the possibility is to discretize those random variables. That works for sure. And this problem can be discretized. Or maybe it's possible, but this you would have to figure out to do these continuous random variables. But for sure in this case, this problem can be discretized uh, if you want. Anyway, so if we put in Gini, we would put here 0, 1, to an up to a maximum number that we would consider. And then we have to specify now the conditional probability table of this, which is um, but this is the, the what we have to. I mean, without that, it's just the the, likely, the likelihood, and in this case, it's the normal distribution with mean value mu r and uh, standard deviation from the the batch. Yeah. But now it's also conditional on n, and how do I introduce this condition on n? I think, no. or I don't know what do you mean? Okay, so, question, so basically, if I don't have n here, and I just had it like we had it before, then x1 this leads actually over to the next uh, lecture in a way. So the the, the um, conditional distribution of x1 given uh, mr would be the normal distribution with mean value mr and standard deviation uh, 20 it was, no? The within batch variability. Mm? So, because the, the mean value is the mean value of the batch and the standard deviation is the within batch variability. So that is a normal, so without this, it would just be a normal distribution with mean value this. And now I have it to, but now it needs to be conditional on MR and on N. So let's say the number is three or, 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 or zero or one or two. Somehow this has to be modified here. No. 
the center division will not change because n just tells us whether this test is actually done or not. The quality of the, 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 quality of the, the information is, stays the same. I mean, it stays the same. Like, say like this. Uh, what, what it does change is that it should be more like we had before, that when n is, I mean, let's take it the first test. When is this first test done? Whenever n is larger than 1, or equal, larger or equal 1. So basically, I would, uh, we, can, we can do the same thing as we do here. So if n is 0, then the test outcome here is like here's zero, no outcome is. Yes? When it's one or more, then the test outcome is the one, this, this distribution that we had. No? The conditional distribution of x1 given mr, which is, and the same here. No? So here, whenever n is larger or equal two, then we have this distribution. Otherwise, no outcome. And in this way, we can do the first. If you want to consider many many uh, a large number of possible tests, it becomes a bit large here. But, but this does not add any computational problems for the Bayes network. Maybe if you want to, if you want to manually include 100 uh, nodes with Gini, it's a bit annoying. But uh, in terms of computation, it's not an issue. Yeah, just speak. But, but for, the, for this particular example, uh, where we consider this uh, special case of the uh, known Yes. The unknown mean, which is MR, um, the information actually comes only in terms of n and x bar. In the normal distribution case, yeah. that's yeah, the. Yeah, in this case, this is more general, but in, in, in the case we discussed, uh, so we modify MR by knowledge about n. Yes. So there has to be a direct relation, uh, by direct R between n and MR. And, uh, and only x bar is also modifying MR. So uh, one single node that represents x bar, uh, x bar and uh, decision node n uh, would, would be enough. So the decision node n would go directly into MR. And n would also go into x bar. And then there's an arc between mr and x bar. And then the, and the arc between n and x bar we only need for the case of n equal to 0. Sorry? The arc between n and x, x bar we only need uh, for the case uh, uh, of No. Because otherwise no, that's not true. Because this distribution depends on the number of tests that you do. No, not. It does. It's not a distribution; it's only an observation. Yes, yes. But to specify this, uh -huh. you have to specify the distribution of x bar conditional on m r, and the standard deviation of this decreases with n. I mean, let's do you. Let's do put this to infinite. Then x bar is equal to m r. Yeah, but, that, but that's and if you that, have. Uh, Yes. Then we always have evidence on x bar. Yes. Yeah. And then we don't need that. We would not need that argument. No, we do need it. Then we have evidence on x bar. We will have evidence, but I mean, we still we have to specify here the conditional distribution, and the conditional distribution of x bar given m r is a function of n. It this is because the standard deviation of this decreases with the square root of n. Yeah, but when we always have evidence on x bar, we don't have to specify the distribution. We always have to specify this distribution. Even if, when you put it, you, you could put evidence, but you still have to specify this distribution because you specify this node. Yeah, that's the information that talks about. Otherwise, actually, if you don't do that, it, you, you would imply that n, n does not have any effect. Yeah. So whether, you, whether this comes from one test or from infinite number of tests is the same, but it's obviously not because so that's neat. But so basically, this would be the normal distribution with mean value mr, and standard deviation would then be uh, mr divided by square root of no, sigma, sigma, no, 20, to be 20 divided by square root of n. Yes? So this here would be a normal distribution, mean value, 
MR. So it's conditional on MR. And standard deviation is square root of, of uh, N times 20. Sorry. Oh, no space now. 20 times this. Huh? Sorry. 20 times this is the standard deviation. And then that will give me the. Yes. So, yes, actually. One divided by N. Oh, sorry, yes. Yes, and then the rest of the network can stay now. Okay, let's go. Yes, so we can you can do it like this actually. In this case, so it's most that's easier to implement. And even if you go to a more general model where both the mean and the standard deviation is known, is not known. Patient updating to the inverse gamma. Uh, the information is always coming into packs. But here it's only the it's bar. And then, and when we have the more general case, it would be the central standard deviation, the central mean, and yeah, then. But, but, but always for the case of the normal distribution. Yeah, of course. In the super general yeah. case, you consider each data. Then uh, it becomes a little bit bad when you would want to consider 2,000 possible. <coughs> if you, if you consider but actually, for the computation, it doesn't matter. For the, so, of course, we do it by hand in Genius, but if you program it in MATLAB, uh, you can just include as many as you want. Uh, and for the computation, it doesn't matter. So, that's not the problem here. Um, all right, so we had this. Now, all right, we can also, okay, we can also go to the special case since it's a bit, since it's a bit uh, more, uh, requires less space. So, we had here R. We had here the W somewhere. Then we had the general capacity. And then we had here the, the, the performance of the failure. And here was the Q. Um, so we have specified this. This is, uh, I think, trivial, no? So this is a known distribution. Um, wait. What did we do? <laughs> I'm sorry, what did we do, I say? Because... Uh, oh, no, what did I do? Hmm? I mean, what I'm saying is there should not be a link here, no? This doesn't make sense. Because the number of tests does not affect the mean value of R. I mean, there's nothing uh, that will tell. This, this would imply that the number of tests has an effect on the mean value of R, but it doesn't. Yeah, but the mean value of R is the distribution with uh, this uh, mu prime or mu two prime and uh, sigma two prime. And the number of observations is affecting the sigma. Double prime, <coughs> not, the, not, not the prior. It's the posterior. Oh, but, but the two prime. Then, uh, when you have observations, then with MR, uh, it gets different parameters. So MR is a normal distribution. Yeah, but uh, what? So the standard deviation, depending on whether we have uh, prior or posterior, is uh, okay. But uh, maybe this point is good that you mentioned this because, okay, I'm standing with my point that there should be not, not be no link here. <laughs> what you're saying is that when I observe this, this changes. Yes. That's basically what you're saying. So once I observe something here, I fix a number of n. That then I I observe something here. That will then affect the distribution of MR. That's basically what your statement is. Which is true, but but this is actually, I mean, as I put here evidence, this will propagate to here and we get a new distribution of MR. But if I would have a, a link here, it would imply that the mean value of R, the actual mean value of R, would depend somehow on, on the test, and, and the test does not change. The, the, it changes our knowledge about it. 
but we have to be careful. So these arrows don't represent they don't represent our knowledge. Our knowledge is represented by the, the probability distributions. And, and if we put evidence somewhere, those I mean, for example, if we put evidence here, those these separation rules tell us that that this one, this one, this one, and this one will all be updated. This one will not be updated. Um, but if I put here evidence, then I will update. This, this distribution will be updated, hence this and this and this will be updated. And that's what happens. Um, I don't, but I don't have to add, an, otherwise I would get again into this diagnostic idea that I have to, I observe this, hence I should make an arrow like this, but that's oh, not but, the case. Uh, you, you, have, you have a random verb in MR, right? So that's yes. Verb. Yeah, yeah. And that random verb, maybe we don't know anything that follows uh, a normal distribution, which is via mean and standard deviation. Exactly, yes. And now, and now uh, you want to express the conditional random variable only conditional on x bar, on an observation of x bar. That's only one number. Yes, we put here a number, yes. Mm -hmm. yeah, one number. Yes. So this number uh, affects uh, the mean and the standard deviation. Of the, of the mean value of R, mm -hmm, yes. but together with n. Yes, but so uh, yes, when but. When you look at the equations, it's not, it's not enough to only uh, have information about x bar. You also have to have yeah, information yeah. about n. But what you have to realize is that in the, this is the nice thing about the Bayesian network. So, because this is automatically taken into account. Only for the period of story analysis. No, but you put, I, I can put here evidence, don't make it. So if I put here evidence, yeah. when I have evidence here, these become connected. So they, they become actually dependent. And that's exactly what happens. When you change n, you get a different, this changes. Because of exactly this fact, this thing. It will actually be automatically like this. Okay. That, because you, when you change n, and that's why, you know, they, this, the distribution of this here depends on n. And uh, so, let's say I'm observing a value of, uh, let's say I'm observing a value of, I don't know, 410. If that comes from only one test, the effect on this will be relatively minor as compared to when this comes from 10 tests. And that's because here, yeah. the, 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 the standard deviation increases. But, yeah. So but, we have uh, for all different um, uh, observations of x, we get these different distributions. Mm -hmm. So how, how do you specify uh, a distribution only based on information on x bar? So how but does wait, this so, probability look like? So if you think of the of, of the I mean, this is a Bayesian analysis, so forget about the rest here. Right? Just look at this problem now, mm -hmm. and. And what we do is a Bayesian analysis of, and we want to update this here, MR. This is what we also have done. And, and what we have here, this here is the likelihood function, yes? This here is exactly the likelihood function. It's, it's the, it's a, so, so this here, oh, the input that goes to this node is the, the probability of X bar given MR and given N. But N is in a way, always fixed, but uh, so, so what we have, but for a given value, so in principle this is a function of, of MR and N. So, so what is the input here is, so this thing here is the distribution of X bar given MR and also given N. Huh? N huh? So it's depending on N. Uh, but for a fixed value, of, if you fix, if once you fix n, this is, this is the likelihood function. Um, so x bar given mr comma n, and this is the likelihood function of mr, and it depends on n. So when I do the Bayesian updating and I change the n, because this function changes, my posterior changes, and and. This is exactly what you also use in your, implicitly use in your normal, in your analysis. Mm -hmm. It's exactly this function. So, so that's why, 
this, this, this information on this n actually changes the posterior distribution of this. No? So uh, this is exactly you know that, so when when, we, when I introduced yesterday the Bayesian network, it seemed like okay, yes, it's kind of logical and it's easy, but then you realize that actually when you go and, and the, I mean I have a lot of experience. I've been using these things for more than 10 years. So you, you, you actually, it's very easy to make a mistake you know, because you confuse or you can mistake the, the way information flows from the way things are related to each other in a kind of causal sense. You know? And so what you really try to strictly, to strictly think of, okay, the arrow here, does it mean, it really implies that N would change MR. And that would mean that the test will change your physical quantity, and unless you have a destructive test, that should not, if you have a non-destructive test, that should not happen. Huh? Yeah. So, sometimes it, it, it's better to think less, actually. <laughs> it's difficult to think less. No? Um, and, yes. So there is, uh, but you see, so I made a mistake, and I put here this arrow, because I didn't, really, I didn't think about it, and then, so I realized it. Okay, so that's, so now this is the thing, and now we still, have, we still need to, uh, yeah, these are the two decisions, N and W, and now we need the utilities. Where do we have utilities? Where is utility node? The cost of observation. Observation, sorry, yes, okay. Uh, so. Here, somewhere, mm -hmm. or have here a cost of the test. How we call it? C N. Cost of observation. Cost of failure. Cost of failure. C F. Design cost. And design cost yes. How do you call the design cost? You often? Just the fix. But no, there was no variable for it. Construction cost. C, construction, or is it? Yeah, yeah, Okay, so I feel like this. Right? Yes, okay, so I think that should be it. Right. Okay. Yeah, please. After capacity instead of W. Would it be an error or uh, here? Yeah. Both W and both yes, it would not give you the same result. Because the capacity is a function or is it dependent both on R, which is just the strength of the material here. Yeah and W, but in the, at least in this example, it depends only on W, it does not depend on R. But once, if you put it here as a child of here, you can't separate the effect of those two, so you would have... The mean value yeah. of R, yes. So, it, yes. Yeah, so in this case, they, they will not work. Yes. Okay. Yes. And so this is something that. Um, okay. Yeah. This I would say. Okay. If you want to, for practical purposes, no. If you want to actually implement this, you could actually implement that in, in for example, in Genie. The only problem is you would have to discretize those random variables, and that's, you know, not so. I mean, you can. Tr uh, you can discretize it in many states here. No. So in principle, you could discretize it in hundred states. If you, you don't do it manually, I hope. But if you. You could discretize these in hundreds of states. That would not be a big problem uh, in terms of computation or size of the, 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 the conditional probability tables. Um, that would be an option. Another option would be to uh, oh. yes. 
Uh, I mean, another option is to use, I mean, so, so you can do, do this with discretization. You can use also st a stochastic optimization algorithm, which I will discuss tomorrow. Um, or at least yeah, quickly discuss tomorrow that, what, what, what one could use. Or you go and, and you, 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 you take this um, um, and basically s solve the problem by using the Bayesian network only to compute the probabilities. So you basically calculate for given values of n and for given values of w, you fix n and w, then you can, once you fix those two, you can run the, you can just run the Bayesian network analysis here. It gives you a probability of a failure to which you get the corresponding risk. And then you repeat this analysis for, multiple, for different values of W and N. Yes. So basically, you're using the Bayesian network here. And for this, you can use all these different Bayesian network algorithms. Um, and this you could also do offline. So you, I mean, for example, I could use this likelihood. Uh, remember that yesterday I showed you the code for this likelihood weighting um, algorithm that is 10 lines of code. Um, so I could use uh, that if I want, or any other algorithm that I have in a Python, MATLAB, whatever. And then just do it for different values of n and w and run an optimization over n and w. Of course, this is a mixed, discrete, continuous optimization, so it's not so straightforward, uh, but you just have two parameters each other. Okay. Which basically, or, or you can also, obviously, since this is an analytical solution here, you can use Jochen's analytical solution to basically solve whatever we do, whatever we represent here with the Bayesian network, you do that for different values um, of n and w. It's basically what we, we, we saw yesterday. And then get the optimal solution. So this is an example where you know, there, is a, there is a relatively simple analytical solution and you, know, you don't get it from here. What, what you get from here, in my view, is that one actually can better understand uh, the, the, this relation. One can hopefully better understand what is actually the meaning of, 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 of these, these tests, and which I think it was not so straightforward to understand initially. Um, but the computations are more easily done with something else. The Bayesian network? There's a Bayesian, I mean, the, the one that I'm aware of is uh, called, uh, you mean you can just Google MATLAB Bayesian network. Uh, so I'm, they, what is it called? Um, MBNT or something like this? Yeah, yeah. Uh, We're talking about MATLAB. MATLAB, yes. No, B, I meant BNT. It is the one, yes. And this, but this is actually interestingly quite an old code. This is like from 2003 or something like this. It was by, done by this guy from Murphy that was doing it in, in Berkeley. And since then, I'm not aware that there is something else in MATLAB. I know that in Python there's also a number of them. Um, and then there's also some you can find in, in R, I think. It is, and in other. So there's a number of, 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 of codes. Uh, I'm not the biggest expert on all these codes, so I have used the MATLAB one, which works quite well, but uh, I'm not so familiar with uh, other, other codes. But it's not like I could recommend you one that, that I always use, but I'm also not checking all the time. I mean, when I was checking five or ten years, five years ago or so more, there was not much more than, or not much, not, not things that were much better than this uh, base net toolbox, uh, but there's also a lot of development in, 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 this, in this community, mostly in Python, so I'm not sure if there's something better now. Okay. Yes? Uh, can you elaborate a little more about the input of XBAR in uh, Gen? Of? XBAR. Um, uh, in Gini? Oof. 
There is a, I already said before, I'm not a big expert in Genie because I use it only for classes and I have not, I know that, I, I know the students of mine have used it for continuous, uh, modeling continuous nodes. And since actually this is a normal distribution, typically it should be possible to, to input, I'm not sure how it works. I, I know that in, in uh, Yugin, which is another software, but maybe this you can do in Yugin also. Yugin is another software that is uh, commercial, but there's a free version with the limited capabilities. There you can input the normal distributions. In, in, in Gini you can uh, use inverse diagrams with continuous nodes. Also, yes. okay. The yes. problem is that it uh, tends to crash. <laughs> okay, yeah. I mean the thing is that here, because we have this special case of all everything being Gaussian, also in Gini, you can actually directly, you can do exact inference also with Gaussian. I mean, so the Gini is, I'm not sure about uh, Gini here, uh, Yugin, I mean. Yugin at least has this, uh, smart enough to realize that if everything is Gaussian and linear, as we have it here, that there is an exact uh, solution. And just calculates, at least the Bayesian network calculates it exactly. And I would assume that this also translates to the, to the, um, to the influence diagram that it can actually, in this particular case here, use the fact that the Bayesian network can be solved exactly, because everything is Gaussian and linear, so that it can solve. So, we, so there, at least in Yugin, you can, you can input this as a condition or normal distribution. And I'm sure in Gini you can also do it, but uh, I'm not the biggest expert on this. So maybe you, if you spend one, one hour today or two, maybe you can, fi you can figure it out uh, and tell us tomorrow. But uh, the thing is this, you know, when you are a PhD student, when I was a PhD student, I was coding a lot and doing all kinds of stuff. And then uh, when I was a postdoc, I was still coding a lot. And then I became a professor and then I was still coding quite a lot, but then I had more and more and more students and now I have no time to, or well, little time to actually sit down and uh, do some coding. So I, when I have an idea, I just tell my students and they implement it. So I'm, uh, I know all the concepts, but I have a very poor in implementing them. Uh, uh, or I always use the things I already know. I use the, the tools that I already know. So this tool I just use for teaching. And I limit myself to the simple type of problems. But I mean, there's a way of doing it somehow. Just don't ask me to show you now how. Equation, decision, chance, deterministic. I think it's to do with the equation, no? You have to put the equation node and then somehow you can put there the conditional distributions as, as distributions. Other question? Uh, I'm wondering do we need to consider about the load, because the damage in general is maybe may different for each of the observation. So I'm wondering do we need to consider about this case uh, the same as we consider about the uh, mean value of R. I'm not sure I understand what you're implying. I mean, for a Q. Yes? Uh, uh, do we need to consider about the change, the change of Q? Yeah, because the damage may be different. Uh, you think that, okay. So, I mean, here, in the Johans model, the assumption is that there is, if there's a failure, there's a certain cost. Doesn't, there's only one type of failure, so it's failure or no failure. That's the assumption. Of course, you could think of a case where you say that the failure caught the consequences do not depend just on whether you are failure or not, but also on whether you what, what was your, your load at the time of failure. It could be reasonable, because you're going on the bridge, that the more load there is, the higher the consequences, because it means that there are more cars on the bridge or more trucks on the bridge. Which we could include, how would we then change the, the network here? If we would do that? If we said that the consequences somehow depend also on the, the magnitude of the load. Arc. Yeah, we just have to put an arc here, huh? from arc from Q to CF. So if we do that, then we can define the consequences in function of whether or not they are failure and what was the time of Q at the uh, what was the value of Q at the time of failure? So we could define that, but in this example, it's not defined like this. Huh? But yes, you can also consider you can also consider monitoring the load. Huh? But, uh, there are many possible extensions that one can do. Huh? 
Okay. Yes. All right. So just I will just do something very fast. Okay. Just five, ten more minutes, or five more minutes on on this influence diagram, and then I will speak maybe half an hour on on, on this likelihood function. Um, so. Sebastian, of course, already introduced the general, and you, most of you know already this general idea of value of perfect information, uh, of information, sorry, that's what we want to compute. But there are also these, these intermediate concepts, and I don't know if um, many of you are familiar with those. This value of perfect information, value of partial perfect information, and conditional value of information. I don't know. Who, is, who has heard of value of perfect information? Somewhere else, so I would expect this. But, and that's actually quite a useful concept, uh, I find, also in explaining this idea of value information. And then these are, okay, this actually I will not discuss now here. Uh, this is some unique concept, but this value of partial perfect information is related to this. So the value, and now what we see here is this. What is the value of perfect information? It's basically, the difference between the left side and the right side. Okay. So, um, the left side is the prior vision problem. So now let's let's go back to this uh, problem of the slope. Yeah. Um, and this was the prior problem. Yeah? Now that, that uh, we had this discussion before, or, or the question before, how do I specify my likelihood function? The geotechnical engineer has to somehow specify the likelihood function. It's challenging for him or her. Um, well, prior to do that, we can just calculate the value, the expect, it's an expected value, those are all expected values, the value of perfect information. We say, hypothetically, let us assume we have the possibility of making a perfect test. What is the value that such a perfect test would have? And that's very simple to, at least in the Bayesian influence diagram now, to consider is just saying that at the time of making the decision, we know uh, we know theta. Yes. And it means that we, and we can maybe make the example now for this example. So, so we, we assume hypothetically that we would know exactly the value of theta. We still don't know what it is, but you hypothetically assume that when we make the decision, we, we will know what it is. And we will always make the perfect decision. So if we know that the slope is moving, we will make a deep foundation, and if it's not moving, we will make the shallow foundation. And what would the expected cost of that be compared to the expected cost of this? And this difference is the value of perfect information. And the good thing is this is an, is an upper bound. So the upper, it's an upper bound. Any information we collect, how infinite amount of data we collect, can never give us more value than this upper bound. And it's helpful because it gives us an indication what we sh potentially might maximally spend on, on, on collecting information. Mm -hmm. It also it, it's helpful because it shows that that upper bound does not depend at all on the on the on, on the type of monitoring system we have. Mm -hmm. It's purely it's purely decided by the the, the decision problem mm -hmm. by how much uncertainty we have and what is the decision and its consequences. So we can quickly do it and check it for this uh, problem of uh, we had here. So I'm going back. Oops. I'm going back and I delete the posterior problem. So we are back at the prior problem. We remember that without additional information, we should choose the deep foundation, and it costs um, 400. Yeah, that's the optimal choice. Now, what happens if we? Oops. Uh, 
have this. Well, the problem is now that Genie itself does not directly give us the answer here. Yes? It tells us that, okay, if we observe, or if, if we observe, if we know that the, the slope is stable, we should choose the shallow foundation, which is something we, obviously we will also know ourselves. And if it's moving, we should choose the deep foundation. We have to do the calculations actually by hand, but it's not a very difficult calculation because we also know that the probability of having a shallow foundation, sorry, a stable slope, this probability is 0 0.7, so the, so the, 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 the expected cost or utility, if you want, I'm doing it utility now, the expected utility, given that I have a perfect information, um, uh, how to write, uh, okay, I don't want to write, okay. I want to do it a bit far, I don't want to write the full expression here, so I'll just write the, 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 the result, so we have minus 200 times 0 0.7 plus m minus 400 times 0 0.3 and that will give us uh, 260, no? Minus 260. Yes? So that's, this value is the expected utility and assuming that I have perfect information. Hmm? Of course, if I actually have perfect information, it means that I will either, I will either know that we are in this case, in which case I have the cost of my expected cost of minus 200, or I will have this and then it's minus 400. But since I actually don't know yet what will be my future perfect knowledge, it's the, uh, this weighted average. So, and then I compare that, this 260 I compare to my minus 400 that I get a priori. And that means that my, con my, um, my value of perfect information is equal to 140. Yeah. For any test that I have, will give me a benefit of at maximum 140, or in this case 140,000 euros. Yeah. Well, any test that costs more than that, there's no point in doing it. Because it's not going to be, I mean, even if it's perfect, it will not give me more value than that. This is the kind of an upper bound. <laughs> the actual value of the information, I think, was in the order of 60. And but just because, because, we can, because we can also understand that when we calculate the, the, the actual value of information, so for example, this is in the order of 60, we can also see how close we are to the upper bound. So, you know, does it make sense to maybe say uh, we, we should try a better test or we should try an additional test? Something I'm going to mention tomorrow is that we might just consider to do a second test or a third test. Uh, in any case, I can already say that if one test costs 20, I, it doesn't make sense to do more than seven tests because more than seven tests will not give me any, any cannot be positive net benefit. So this is, so this is a very useful concept it's, and it's much simpler, in a way, much simpler to implement because you don't need to do Bayesian updating. Um, and you don't need to know the likelihood, so you don't need to know the quality of your information. And it gives you a first indication. And then there is something related to that. And that's the, oops, there are some examples in the lecture notes. There are some examples in the lecture notes that you can do. And then there's the value of partial perfect information. Here the idea is that in most real life problems, only a part of the uncertainty is reducible. So we go back here. 
you could think that, okay, maybe we can reduce, maybe reducible means we can learn something about it. So maybe we could say that maybe we can learn something about Q, but typically for the load, maybe we could learn about the statistics of Q, but the load itself, the future load itself, typically cannot be learned at least deterministically. Mm -hmm. So there's always a component here that we even, we, are no, we know we can never know in advance. So let's assume now that we have the perfect statistics of Q, but we don't know the, 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 when, when it, what will be the maximum value. We don't know if at this, a certain probability with which a certain high, uh, large truck will drive over this bridge, but we don't know when it happens and if it happens. And so this uncertainty cannot be reduced. We cannot learn anything about this. So when we would calculate the value of perfect information, we would assume that we know exactly Q and R, but that doesn't somehow make sense because I'm never going to learn about Q. So instead, we can calculate the value of partial perfect information, which is we assume that for those, for those random variables where we can collect information, we, will know, we, we know them perfectly. But for those where it's not possible to collect information, we still consider them as random. And then we do the kind of same analysis that I showed before. So in principle, I mean, if I show it in terms of a Bayesian network, it means that I'm, so this is now not just one parameter, but it's multiple parameters. It's a vector of parameters. And I'm separating those into those that are reducible, meaning we can actually learn something about them. They are also sometimes called epistemic. And those here are irreducible, sometimes called aleatory. We cannot learn anything about them. Um, and then we look at this problem. So we assume that we have full knowledge of those, but we have no knowledge of those. And we can do it in the same way. We just put every, we just, we just add this link here. We calculate the expected cost associated, utility associated with that, compare it to the original situation, and we get, again, an upper bound on what we can potentially gain from, from, from collecting information. And, uh, yeah, so that's, um, for example, this example that I mentioned with the Rockfall Gallery, you know, the, this engineer could have said, okay, there is uncertainty on the rock, and the size, and the, the, the impact, there's uncertainty on the impact load, and there is an uncertainty in the model, in the, react, uh, the, the, the structural model of the structure. And he could have looked at this and said, okay, you know, this is what I can, I can improve my model up to the point where I have a deterministic, exact model of, of the impact, and I will not learn, by improving my model, I will not, never learn anything about the, the load. So he could have compared this to this and saw, realized that there is not much point in doing any analysis because the, the, you would have seen that the value of partial perfect information would be very small. Yeah. So this is often a useful concept and tool to, to, to do an, an initial analysis before you go and actually model the likelihood and try to understand the quality of your information. Okay, so this is the last one here that just summarizes these ideas that basically if this is the prior, and you compare this prior to this to get the perfect information, value of perfect information, you compare it to this to get the value of partial perfect information, and you compare it to this situation to get the value of information. This summarizes this free type of Analysis. Okay. Yes. Okay. There's some more. Uh, this so this concludes uh, this lecture uh, for the influence diagram. We can practice it a bit. I will come back to it a bit, a little bit tomorrow when we speak of sequential decision making. I'll 
start with this slide here where, where we look at, you know, if we now consider multiple tests, not just one, we start to have a sequential problem and how do we extend this and this will be for tomorrow. So any final question so far? No. Good. Okay, so we have half an hour for the lunch break and I want to use this to discuss this topic of, of modeling this node here that uh, what I already called, said is the likelihood hmm? it's the likelihood yes? so how do we in, in how do we represent or what what, what is the, the representation of, uh, of of this node and we will try to make it very brief hopefully and then have maybe 10 minutes or at the end to or 15 to discuss and see if some of you have, in your applications, assuming that you have already started working on, on specific applications in your PhD, what is the likelihood, how does the likelihood function look like in your application? I prepared some slides here. So the material you have seen so far is almost entirely, not completely, but almost entirely in the, in the lecture notes except for a few slides I had on, 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 the, on the specific applications. Um, so I will not go into distribute those slides. The, what I'm presenting now is not in the, oops, oops, it's not in the, oh, this is what other people do here. This is what my daughter is doing there, five minutes from here. Um, so this is this thing is not on the lecture no, uh, in the lecture notes. So I'm going to upload the slides of the, these few slides here. Yes. Okay. Uh, Elizabeth is a PhD student, and she has helped me to do some of these slides. Um, I know some some of you were in the course in Como. She was presenting in the Como course also. Um, let's jump right into it. I already said that the, in the Bayesian network, the information is typically a child of the quantity that we want to know about. Let's first look at the simple case here on the left side. I've already considered here the fact that we actually have, if we do a monitoring over time or if we do inspections at multiple points in time, we end up having, you know, a, uh, kind of a temporal network. But if you consider only a, an initial test, just forget about the rest and, and we can just consider one time slice. No? The initial test is just one time slice. But because we can have multiple many time slices. And I'm kind of consistent with what Jochen explained yesterday. I'm um, distinguishing between a direct situation and an indirect situation. It direct means I'm able to directly monitor my condition. So let's say my condition is whether the structure is corroded or not. This is what I'm interested in. And I can direct well, directly meaning that I have a, a, something that, that measures the corrosion. It's still, the, what, I, what I get is still, in most cases, an imperfect representation of my condition. So think of the half cell potential measurement. It cannot actually you know, give you a complete exact picture. It just gives an indication, but it gives an indication directly of whether or not it's corroded. But let's assume that our con the condition of interest is not, is not the, whether it's corroded or not, but what we're interested in is whether it's safe or not, or whether it will fail or not. In this case, what I'm, what I'm uh, trying to observe is related to the corrosion, and that again, that in turn is related to the, to the, to the, 
to the condition. Hmm? Well, it's actually not, that's not a very good example, actually, I realize. We should make a different one. Let's make a different example. Let's say I'm, um, I want to know, again, the, the, whether, my whether my structure is, in a good, is, is, is healthy or not. I take the stiffness of the structure as an indication. So I'm saying if, the, if there is some change in the stiffness of the structure, there is a, it's an indication that I have a problem. So the stiffness of the structure is taken as an indicator. And the stiffness is something I can try to indirectly measure by looking at eigenfrequencies and so on. So I have just to, to and the, the, the distinction is not always clear. I mean, it's not a clear cut distinction between this and this. You can also always reduce this model to this model. But just to make it clear that, that um, it can be that, I mean, it can be that we, we define the, this likelihood function relating a monitoring result or, or, or inspection result to directly to the condition, or that it relates to an indicator, and then I have to relate the indicator to my condition. In which case, in a way, I have here first a likelihood that describes my test, and then I have an additional model that describes the relation between my indicator and my actual condition. So, and then the third case, that I'm, again, one could probably construct even more cases, but the third common case is that I actually observe not the condition of the structure, but I, I make observations of the environment or the load. So it could be the loads, like you could measure, try to measure cues or loads. We also measure chemical environment, so for example, for corrosion, we might measure the chloride uh, concentration or temperature, um, humidity. So we might measure that, and then the model is a bit different, so we, we have that this environmental parameter or the load affects the condition, and we have the likelihood function. That is, again, here's the Bayesian network. Yeah? So again, we have the, 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 rela the causal relation is in this direction. But by learning something about this, or by observing this, we learn something about this, and we learn something in turn about the condition. Yeah? So you can think for your system, you know, what, what best is, which, which, best, which model best describes your, partic your particular case. And it might be that yes, you have to add additional variables, and, and, and you know, it's not, these are not the free only options. Um, but you know now the wage network, so you, you, know, you, have, you, you can kind of relate to the fact that in any case, what I'm, what I'm trying now to, 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 to look at is how do we relate what we observe, this is a monitoring or inspection outcome or a test outcome, to either the condition or to the indicator or to the environmental variables that we have. And depending on the situation, I might need additional relations to get from that to the condition. But I'm now just looking at this green part. And it's called the likelihood function. So who has used the likelihood function in their life? I think almost everybody has used the likelihood function. Okay? So if, you, if you ever tried to fit uh, some distribution in MATLAB, you have used the likelihood function. Um, because the ma maximum likelihood is the most common statistical estimator. Um, and the likelihood function is nothing else, as we already said. So typically, we, we often write it like this, where we say, okay, this is the likelihood of of a parameter theta, this is in the mathematical textbook, no? I mean, theta, which is 
basically equal or strictly x is pro proportional to the probability of a certain observation or data. So I'm calling this uh, <coughs> see here set, sometimes called the D for data or Y or whatever. But this is my observation here or my, what I actually observe. Observation, data, given theta. And in the maximum likelihood, we're trying to find the parameters theta that maximize this. Well, we're trying to find the parameters of the model that, that best explain the observation that I'm doing. Well, this is the idea of the, of the likelihood, of the maximum likelihood. And in the Bayesian analysis, as you also might know, or hopefully know, no? that Jochen, the posterior distribution of theta uh, is again proportional to the prior distribution of theta with the likelihood of theta. Uh, so this likelihood function appears both in the classical uh, maximum likelihood estimator, but also in the Bayesian estimator. So this was the prior model of Jochen, the normal distribution, and this is the likelihood that describes the observation. And in Jochen formulation, it's a bit hidden because he had this conjugate prior and on, but that's what is behind all this. Right? When you look at my notes, in the last chapter, there's the general formula. Yes, exactly. So this is the, the thing, and, and so basically this is my prior knowledge. It's what I know before I do the test, before I have the data, and this describes me the information of the, the observation, the data. And this is here. And in the, I mean, so, so basically the, that's why, here's the Bayesian analysis, and the, the more frequentistic people prefer the maximum likelihood estimator because it does not require any assumption about the prior. We just try to maximize this function here. So, so this describes my data, my observation. And so this is, so all these models that we have to describe the quality of information of my, of my outcome, be it the probability of detection, probability of uh, false alarm, this, this uh, measurement uncertainty, they are all likelihood functions. They are all of this form. This is what I want you to, to, to remember most. Yes. All of those are of this form. And when you have to construct your, your specific model for describing the quality of your SHM, of your inspection. It has to be, in a, in a generic sense, it has to be of this form. So this is also in this slide here. Um, yeah. And this, yes, okay. These are slides of Elizabeth, so I didn't look at them, but they are exactly they are exactly what um, I just said. So, you have it there. Okay, now, the real world, I mean, now we have to look at, okay, what is the, this is very general concept, now how does it look for specific cases? And we can, I tried to make a kind of a classification here of the different cases of, of types of data and, 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 and model parameters that we can have. And in the most, Generally, I distinguish between that the condition itself can be binary, discrete, or continuous. It's, well, I don't say that okay, binary typically is obviously by nature, these this, this are discrete, but the continuous one can also be vector-based. I mean, this can also be a vector, but in, the, in, in discrete say, case, it doesn't actually matter whether you have a vector or not, because the vector just adds number of states. So, but this could also be a vector of uh, continuous so this is the, the condition or, or the indicator. So the, we, we saw before that what could, be, what could be here could be either the condition or if I have this intermediate indicator, it could be the indicator. And then I have the observation result that can also be either binary, discrete, or continuous. I mean, kind of ideally, we are in the diagonal. So if we have a binary condition, we have a binary observation, but all these are possible combinations. And I'm just going quickly through those to see what happens. So if we have a binary binary situation, that's the simplest case. It's binary binary. So just an, this is just an example. We could have no damage or damage, so crack or no crack, 
corrosion, no corrosion. And the, the, the method tells me corrosion, no corrosion, or crack, no crack. So in that case, I have this binary, and this is what is called the confusion matrix. Okay. So um, I have, and this is the same type of probability table as we have in the Bayesian network. Okay. So given theta, what is so given that I have no damage? What is the probability that I observe no damage? And that's one minus PFA, where PFA stands for. Yes. This is a probability of false alarm. So I should actually start it here. So assuming I have no damage, the probability of getting an indication of a damage is the probability of false alarm. Right. That's basically what we have here. That's, that's the thing we don't want. On the other hand, if I have a damage, the, the probability of getting an indication of that damage is the probability of detection. Yes. That's what we want. And then these are just mi one minus these quantities. So, so this is a likelihood function because it's a conditional probability of z given theta. And I guess almost everybody knows these quantities. P of the PFA. Yeah? Okay, so go back. This is the case A yeah? up there. Now comes case B. Case B is that we un which is just an extension in a way of case A, is that either the set or the Y or both are not binary, but are just more generally discrete states. For example, no damage, slight damage, large damage, or uh, number of cracks, zero, one, two, three, four, and so on. So this is just kind of. And we have just an extension of what we have before. This is still a confusion matrix. Just that it's not POD PFA, but it's, there's no real name to it. No? So basically, it's, it's the probability of being correct, which is the, always the probability of these diagonal things. The probability of observing z equal 1 when theta is actually equal 1. And then we have the off diagonals, which kind of indicate different degrees of, of being wrong. So this confusion matrix is, it's not that common because typically this, either, either the outcome is typically binary or it is um, continuous. This case of discre discrete is not that common, but in principle it's, if you have a case, then you need to fill out this confusion matrix to describe the quality of your, your, me your measurement. I'm a bit confused. It's good uh, because it's a confusion matrix. The, the, the second, the set two, set I won't tell you the probability of set two and that I given that data. I agree that there is something wrong. Yes, this should be set two and set two. Yeah, this should be set equal two yeah, yeah. and this should be set equal two. Yeah, yes. You are not confused. This slide is confused. I will just fix it right now. I did, this, these are slides that Elizabeth made for a lecture in, uh, in last semester. So it seems that you are less confused than the students in that lecture. <laughs> I think there were only five of them. And they're only master students. Um, all right. So now we are not confused anymore. Okay, then we have a case uh, C. And C is that now we have a, have a continuous state, but our observation is only binary. And then that would be something that looks like this. So this kind of continues. And then we have here a function. And we also call it typically POD, um, which is the probability of the, the, the detection, or I, I'd rather call it probability of indication, but people call it probability of detection, so I don't. Um, but most likely it's indication, because it's a bit difficult to say detection. For example, sorry it's in German here, but uh, this is a common example. Um, 
Here we have a uh, fatigue crack or the damage size. But you can think of this, for example, as, a, as the size of a crack. In the and now we, 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 we use a non-destructive testing method and this will give some signal. No? And, and then the people who use that give a, put some threshold on the signal and say, okay, if the signal is above a certain threshold, we will make an indication. We say yeah, there is something. And that, of course, can be calibrated, and we come back to that. But once you put the threshold, you, it either says, okay, there is, a, there is something or there is nothing. And now, because this is a continuous thing, you know, so it's, from, it's from zero to, to some maximum value. And, you know, there's never zero crack. I mean, there's maybe 0 0.000001 millimeter crack. Um, but that's not something I want to know about. So I actually so I put some threshold that makes some sense, and then the probability of getting an indication, or detection as they call it, um, increases with the size of the, 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 the defect. So we have uh, some continuous curve like this, so it's known as the POD curve. Yes. So that's, um, again, the likelihood function. And it's, if you think of it, uh, you can just Say that, okay, set, which is binary, is a child of the, of the continuous state. Mm -hmm. There's also, in principle, there are also multidimensional PODs. So it can be that it doesn't depend only on one quantity, but on two. Well, I've seen PODs that define the probability of detection both in terms of crack length and crack depth. But, yeah. So this is the, 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 the case C. Okay, case D, now the opposite. The observation result is continuous, whereas the, the, the state is binary. And here's another example of that. I mentioned already yesterday this case. So there is um, an example where the state is, 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 continue, is discrete. So this is whether we have no corrosion or corrosion. For passive means no corrosion, active means corrosion. And we're, what we see here is a result from a potential, half cell potential measurement. So that method gives you a potential difference between basically you, you, you have to connect your, your device to, to the, the reinforcement and you measure if there's some current. And the current will be different whether you have the potential will be different whether, the, the, whether you have an active case, so a corroded case, or a passive case. So you measure a continuous quantity, and you're trying to, to, to figure out whether it's corroded or not corroded. So the, 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 the likelihood function in this case is a probability distribution, or probability density, conditional on the discrete condition. So, whether, so you have one for active case and one for passive case. And if you have multiple discrete states, you could also have multiple of those. And again, this is the likelihood function. It tells us whether what is the probability or the probability density of, an of a specific outcome given the condition? Now, now in principle, and, and then now I come back to what I said earlier when I showed you these uh, PODs, we can derive a probability of detection from such a continuous case. Actually, that's in a way what they do because. And I should have put, sorry, I have. Okay, I don't, I will not find it so fast. I have some pictures of those things, but I forgot to put it here. Um, so basically, what, what you end up with is you have a concrete surface, and on that surface, you, you, you do the measurement in many, at multiple points, and at each point, you get a potential. So at one point, you have minus 500, at some point, you have minus 300, minus 100, so you have this point. And then you have to make a decision whether something should be done or not. So for each point, 
the engineer in the end has to decide whether to do something or not to do something. He has to decide, okay, is it corroded or not corroded? And it's not actually the way you should do it, but the way it is done is that the people fix a certain potential and say, okay, based on these curves, we would say, okay, around here, if we are on this side, we have no corrosion, and if we are on that side, we have corrosion. That's how we interpret it. This is a, de de a deterministic interpretation. That's why I think it's, it's not how you should actually do it. What you should do is you should use those two curves, put them in your Bayesian analysis, and just calculate the posterior probability of corrosion and use that. But the way they do it is they use this more deterministic interpretation, and they say, okay, everything that has a potential here is not, is, we interpret as not corroded, and here we interpret it as corroded. And from this, we can now construct the POD. So, how can we see in this figure, so this is the, the threshold that they put. This is not corroded, so this is the distribution given that it's not corroded. This is the distribution given that it's corroded. Everything, every result on this side is interpreted as corroded. Every result on this side is interpreted as not corroded. How can we see on this figure the probability of detection? Yes, that's uh, we, so. We, the, sec the first coin is you mean this one or this one? Uh, that's one. Okay, so you take this. You took the CDF up to this point, and that gives you the. Okay, now exactly <laughs> probability of detection. Yes, so because it because everything that is up to here, you will actually interpret as being corroded, and it is actually corroded, so that's the probability of detection. And if you take this little thing here, it's the probability of, not one minus the probability of detection. Okay? So this area here gives you the, the probability of missing a corroded area. So this is the probability of detection, correct? And the probability of false alarm? We take the other figure, and we do the CDF again. Yeah? So this area here, the small area here will be the probability of false alarm. Yes. And now we come to what I try, what I mentioned yesterday, and probably you were not able to understand from what I said. But maybe now it becomes more clear. Is that I can move this threshold around, okay? And here I, this is a different, this is a hypothetical example, but so I have these two curves, and in this case. It's, the, it's just turned around, so, I mean, it depends on the interpretation. Uh, here, it just turned around. So the PFA and the POD are, are now the, the, on the right side. And what you see here is the threshold. And this threshold is moved. So I can start to here, say I'm very conservative, and I'm interpreting everything here as, as, a, as an event, as a failure, or as a problem. And then I'm very conservative. Or I move the threshold to the right, and then I'm becoming less and less conservative. And you see as we move those to this, this threshold, we change both POD and PFA. And that's how we get to the receiver operator characteristic. Yes. So, and, so I, and did you see these this two situations correspond to the two points shown there. And this point here corresponds to having the threshold here so nothing is interpreted as, a fa as, a, as an event. And the point here will correspond to the threshold being here, where POD and PFA are both one, because we interpret everything as a defect. And you see this, uh, so this is a very common way of representing the, 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 uh, the, the likelihood function or the, the quality of, an, of, of, of uh, monitoring, but also this also is very often used in statistics, this ROC curve, as a, 
as a way of describing the, the quality of a predictive model. And nowadays, in this, all this predictive modeling, machine learning, you see very often this receiver operator characteristics curve as a way to describe how good is my, my, predict, my a, a predictive model for a binary classification problem. You want to say something? Yes. Uh, well, thank you for introducing this uh, concept. I uh, would like to pose the question to you, Daniel. Um, how should uh, the threshold be uh, determined? Uh, should we? Uh, what should we do? Uh, should we use this receiver operating characteristic, or should there be, or could there be another method? Well, people have. I mean, well, as we know, the op thank you, this is a very good question. No? So, so now we, it's a, it's a classical problem. No? We have to now optimize the threshold. No? Should we, how should we choose the threshold? And I've seen some papers that people try to, I mean, they say that, okay, I don't know, define some kind of distance measure, because this is the optimal point. You know? They try to find some kind of distance measure or whatever. But I mean, in principle, we are still in a decision analysis problem. And what we should do, is we should make an influence diagram or a decision tree or we should think of the decisions and the consequences, make a decision tree and take this threshold as the decision variable. This is the, the, the this decision variable at which we, do, we, we, we either do an action or we don't do an action. And we do an optimi we solve the expected utility problem. Because in some cases, and I mean intuitively people do that of course, no? so for example, if you have an aircraft, uh, you, you, you do inspections on a critical component in an aircraft, you obviously want to be very sure that there is, an, or even worse, it's for uh, aerospace or rockets, no? you really want to make sure that there is no defect. It doesn't, in, 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 when, you put, when you produce a rocket, it doesn't really matter if you have to produce the piece, it matters, but not so much, if you have to produce the piece uh, five times as long as you're sure that afterwards it's not going to fail. So you, you rather are conservative, you accept a large number of false alarms, so you, you would want to be very somewhere here maybe. Eh? If you have a low consequence type of failure, so failure is not so critical, um, you rather you know, don't have too many false alarms because those are all produce costs. No? So, you rather accept that maybe you have a bit of lower probability of detection. But this all comes out if you make a, and often in many cases you can do very simple decision analysis. No? Just say, okay, what is the consequence of, what is the cost of, 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 of uh, doing something? Meaning, what is the cost of, of an indication? So in the case of the concrete that I made before, no? what is the cost of, of, of opening that fix or doing something with the concrete? What is the cost of repairing the, 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 the the concrete on the one side and on the other side what is the, the, the cost of of not identifying correctly a failed corroded element what happens if I if it is corroded and I don't correctly identify it and then you can make a simple very simple decision tree and try to find the optimum threshold so that's the way you should approach that and so, I mean, yes, I don't know this, how people come to the idea to suggest the uh, optimum. Op I mean, of course, it's clear that the, the optimum is certainly here and the optimum is certainly here, but, but you really have to consider the cost, and decision analysis gives you the answer. That's what I would think. And in a way, if we, I mean, if, if you put, I mean, in, in our analysis, I would rather direct, I mean, you, you can directly use this information here and use the, the threshold as an optimization parameter and you get all this. That's, and that's why I'm saying is that what the people actually do is that they, you know, they fix this potential without considering the decision problem. Of course, this seems a reasonable range, but without fixing the decision pro without looking at the decision problem, they just fix the threshold and then they use it like this, it's going to be maybe okay, but it's going to be suboptimal. They should use the complete curve, put that in the analysis, optimize, and the analysis will tell them what is the optimal pressure. Okay. 
think that it's almost the end. So there's this, okay, the last case is again, is the continuous continuous case. So both what you measure as well as the quantity of interest is, are both continuous. That's maybe the, almost the most common case. And one example model, a very simple model is just, uh, you know, it's just a measurement uncertainty, you know? So that's how it would look if you have, if you say you measure I don't know what millimeters, or maybe this is a crack size. You try to measure a crack size, uh, then you, your, your uh, likelihood function is just similar to what Jochen had also. Um, it's just a probability distribution, hopefully centered at the true value, if you don't have bias, centered at the true value with a certain standard deviation. Yes. So this here will be, sorry, this here, uh, this, uh, this here will be the, the probability distribution, probability density, mean value, the true value, and the fixed standard deviation or standard deviation that represents your measurement error. And that's also a likelihood function. But that's almost trivial. Okay, so that's basically, that's it. Of course, the question is, in practice, there might be, a bit, you know, as we discussed already earlier, it might be sometimes challenging to actually figure this out. How can we actually determine this? Uh, with something like this, okay, you produce a number of specimens in the lab with, with certain crack sizes. Then you, 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 you run your method and you check, uh, Maybe you repeat it 10 times, and for each defect size, you get uh, a result. And then you, multiple results of your, your outcome, and then you can make a conditional distribution of the outcome given the true value. And then you can construct such something like this. So that's, and so, so, so the, I think the, in the most of the example that we do, what we're trying to do is to separate the likelihood function from the actual structure or system that we're looking at. So the meaning that I want this likelihood function to be a function of the method, of the testing method, but not of the, not of the structure where it applies. Because if that's the case, then I can do some tests, as I said, in the lab or maybe on, on previous structures where I first measure and then I find the true value. Right? And I can use that to make a statistics of the likelihood. In the geotechnical example, that's more difficult because there, the likelihood will always most likely be dependent on the, size, the specific site and the specific conditions. But in the structural, I mean, if I make a test of the, the concrete strength, that's independent of whether it's going to be for that bridge or for that bridge or that bridge. Right? I just do it, uh, I have a certain spec test method. I apply it uh, 10 times, 50 times. I take do uh, those specific specimens to the lab and I test them with a more exact method to get a, a reference truth. I compare my test method prediction with the reference truth and I have 50 samples of that. That gives me an, an idea of the measurement uncertainty. And I can then take that and use that for predicting the measurement uncertainty for other bridges, other concrete structures. Yes? Um, and the same could be done for crack sizes, detecting crack sizes, and so on. Measuring deformations, and so on. So, of course, there are environmental factors that, that affect the, quant the quality of the thing. Sometimes uh, many of these devices are sensitive to the environmental factors, so you have to understand also maybe that. Um, but the but when you are able to, to say, 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 okay, these are independent of the application of the, of the particular structure, then relatively straightforwardly determine them. The continuous, continuous case can maybe also be utilized by just having uh, simultaneous observations on a measurement outcome and the property of interest. Then you have a cloud of uh, measurements. Yes. Represent by uh, 
Yeah. And the like with nothing else that the conditional uh, for the of the conditional on one realization of the measure. Yes. So something like this. Yes, so basically something like this. No? Oh, sorry, not very. <laughs> but uh, here, so that this is what you. Let's say this is, I like to do it like this. So this is my true value, if you want, or like criteria. And this is my set. No? And then you have this cloud. I mean, ideally, you are on this line. No? And this cloud gives you an information. And then you, this cloud gives you an information. No? So basically, and then the likelihood is basically the distribution. Something like this. Right? And what you're interested in? Well, well, then you use this to update. I mean, most people plot this set here and theta here. But this is again the diagnostic thinking. Okay, so if you, the diagnostic thinking is to put here set and here theta, or you say, okay, my theta in function of 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 set, but the kind of Causal thinking is that z is a function of theta. I mean, yeah, it doesn't matter, but here, but I find it helpful to, to plot it in this way. Now, this is, yes. of course, it can also be that this, this standard deviation might be like this, so that the measurement error increases as the size increases. So then you have a multi multiplicative error model, or you have a Additive one. This is basically a regression problem. No? Nothing else. And yes. So just, go, just one, one last thing here. So, so one of the reasons why you know here we could also say the monitoring result z is directly a con we can formulate it z as a function of, of theta here also. But typically what we have is that. This for example, if I take this example, what I mentioned, uh, let's say, uh, no, no, okay, no, it's, okay, no, no good example right now. But um, let's say the, I mean, the condition of the structure is uh, whether the structure is safe or not, and what you measure are some uh, deformation somewhere. Yeah? That relation between the deformation and the, the, the condition of that particular structure is not structure independent. This will depend, you know, if you have a 500 meter long span, you would expect a few millimeters of deformations are not critical. If you have a one meter span and a few millimeters of deformation, maybe are critical. So if you would take the relation directly from this to this, it would not be structure independent. But if you say that my indicator is something, for example, the, 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 the so material property, a stiffness um, value, or something like that, then that might, the relation between that and, and what I measure might be structure independent, and then the relation between that local stiffness and the, oh, no, that's also not a good, ah, sorry, too late. Um, too low, shoot, uh, too low uh, sugar in my blood, I cannot, yeah, I'll think of a better example, but what I wanted to, the, the point I wanted to make is that the separation can help us to, to take the structure, the, the structural specific part here. This is where I, use, where I need a structural model, for example, to relate my condition to something I can observe. And here is the, the thing that this describes the actual measurement device, the, the, the exactness or the, the, the quality of my measurement device. Um, to make to make sure that this is structure independent, hmm? and only this here depends on the, is depending on the structure. So if this is a structural identification, for example, the, this part here might be the, only the, the, the accuracy of your, of your uh, accelerometer. Hmm? That might be probably be pretty good compared to the uncertainty you have in your structural model that relates the accelerations to the condition of the structure. Hmm? And the, the accuracy of the accelerometer is something you can 
take from one structure and put it to the next. Okay. Um, yeah, so. Okay, I think we are almost uh, running over time for lunch, so I wanted to to discuss maybe 10 minutes, but I will not do it now, uh, but uh, we'll do it maybe tomorrow, I'll take uh, 10 minutes or 15 minutes. So my idea, my, my idea was to, to, to ask you um, the type of applications that you're working on in your, in your research what are the like or what are the likelihood functions or, or what are the, how do you describe in your application this uh, quality of the information hmm? maybe you are using these things already uh, all the time maybe it's something that is a bit new and so or maybe it, you're using it but you're not aware of exactly what what format it is so maybe if you think about it a little bit until tomorrow, and then we spend uh, tomorrow maybe 10, 15 minutes just to yeah, to discuss. If that. you make this format, so you are you are invited to uh, volunteer for a short five-minute presentation of what you are doing and how you can relate this to uh, this likelihood and quality uh, information thing, and then we all discuss it. it very you get feedback from us. Yeah. Yes. So we maybe you. Yes, yes. Announce that you want to do it, and then uh, we have an overview how many it will be, and then we somehow sketch the time. It would be very interesting. So it's a, it's a nice opportunity to expose yourself to uh, make food out of yourself. Not the opposite, right? <laughs> we, are, we are in a closed uh, room here, and uh, we know that uh, errors are, of course, uh, entirely uh, valid. And everything is relative to perspective. So it's a good opportunity to discuss and to learn more about your project. That's a very good idea. Okay. okay. There's no so maybe urgent until, question. Uh, until the end of today, you can uh, just announce if you want to do that. Mm -hmm. Perfect.